name is Kylo Ren, and I'm going to rule this galaxy. Grandson of a slave. Heir to the Jedi. Prince of House Organa of Ultra. Last of my people. Nephew to a living legend. Son of... Heroes. But I have a new destiny now. Ben Solo is gone. Only Kylo Ren remains. I know that I am a monster. And I embrace it. Disney apparently didn't care about developing any of that awesome backstory and instead chose the most uninspired tragic hero story where they barely even attempt to explain the fundamental question of why these characters are who they are. I have several videos that explore in depth how terrible a foundation J.J. Abrams built for the sequel trilogy. I've proposed that the single biggest mistake that ruined everything was having too much story take place off screen between episodes 6 and 7. Because while many of us hate the idea of Luke becoming this suicidal hermit, our dislike of the character isn't actually why we hate the story. Our biggest problem with the story is that we don't understand. We can't understand this change that Luke went through because it all happened off screen. If the sequel trilogy had slowly shown us the fall of Luke Skywalker, just as we saw his father fall, sure, many of us would hate that story decision, but at least we could understand the character, how he went from the most optimistic hero in the galaxy to this. And that explanation applies to almost every aspect of the sequels. We don't understand Han because he became a deadbeat dad off screen. We can't mentally reconcile these two people are in fact the same character. We don't understand the First Order because we didn't see how they rose to power and not seeing that struggle makes Leia and her new Republic incompetent failures. We don't understand Snoke's rise to power and why Luke and his new Jedi Order were incapable of stopping him. We understand nothing because we didn't see any of the vitally important plot points that are the backbone of the sequel trilogy's story. But the single biggest unseen plot point we didn't see Ben Solo fall. In fact, I'd wager the writers of Episode 7 couldn't give sufficient explanation as to why Ben Solo turned to the dark side. Given Abram's fascination with the unknown, it seems unlikely to me that he ever intended to explain Hilo's betrayal. Why so many mysteries? What is it about mystery that, that uh, I seem to be drawn to? And I, I was thinking about this, what to talk about. This again. story is about a mystery box named Kylo Ren, a mystery box that the writers waited until the very end of the trilogy to open so they could twist the contents to best fit the prevailing public opinion. Alongside Rey Nobody, the Jedi prodigy, and Finn, the orphan slave soldier, Kylo Ren had enormous potential with one of the most enticing backstories a writer could ever dream of being given to work with. 
Join me as we delve into one of the strongest characters of the entire sequel trilogy as we attempt to discover who was Kylo Ren really and how did the venerated Star Wars franchise deliver us yet another of the most wasted characters in film history. To do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. Did you come back to say you forgive me? To save my soul? Hello everyone, Darth here, and welcome back to another overly analytical video essay. Writers J.J. Abrams and Lawrence Kasdan have said they intentionally wrote Episode 7 to mirror Episode 4, a low-key soft reboot of the franchise for a new generation, and of course they needed a new Darth Vader. So they wrote another intimidating, cloaked, helmeted evil wizard with a memorable voice and cool magic powers. The problem is that these very experienced writers somehow never realized that Kylo Ren simply cannot be written the same way that Vader was written when the story first began. In Episode 4, it doesn't matter who Darth Vader is. It was written as a standalone film with a main villain that needed no explanation. We have a long-standing cultural history of wizards. The bad guys have their Saurumans and the good guys have their Merlins, and the audience needs no explanation because this is how magical fantasy has always been written. Vader is the bad dark wizard to the good white wizards Obi-Wan and Luke. Actually, one could cut out the mystical magic subplot and Vader easily disappears from the story because the main story of the original Star Wars was always the Rebels versus the Empire, which was intermixed with Luke's classic coming-of-age story. However, Vader was introduced as the classical evil antagonist who didn't need a backstory because this was the first movie that laid the groundwork. Vader was able to be anonymous because the story had no precedent. The audience may have wanted to know more about Vader's backstory, about how he knew Luke's father, about why he murdered him, but that information wasn't necessary at all to understand this story. Fast forward 38 years, when Kylo Ren is introduced as the new Darth Vader, in the same mysterious fashion in which Vader had been introduced, only now we find it is entirely impossible to view this character in the same story vacuum that existed when Episode 4 was written. Vader was a brand new character in a brand new cinematic universe that had no established backstory themes or precedents. When The Force Awakens introduces Kylo Ren, the Star Wars Cinematic Universe has had six main films, every one of which introduces world building and characters that must remain consistent for this new villain. The same rules of anonymity that were acceptable for Vader's introduction become examples of poor writing when copied over to Kylo Ren. The writers wanted to introduce a mysterious villain who would leave audience members yearning to learn more. But that is so incredibly difficult to do because... I know where you come from. Before you called yourself Kylo Ren. This character was brand new and had absolutely no history to his name. This character is a legacy with decades of history that define his every action. That, that's a big part of his character is like he is wrestling with the legacy of Darth Vader. And so that's where this conversation gets complicated because Kylo's whole shit is resting on a foundation of that original story. And so we're not just talking about two completely analogous character arcs. Like we're not just comparing Zuko, Kylo, Zuko, Darth, Darth Vader. We're comparing a character whose fundamental involvement in being one of the baddies is buttressed by the story of the other character we're discussing. And that's really interesting to me. That, that's, that's why I'm so fascinated by this. 
With Luke, we saw how a Jedi can be tempted to turn to the dark side and how it's possible to overcome that temptation. We watched Luke grow from an awkward teenager to become a warrior filled with wisdom, compassion, and strength. Next, we jump back in time to watch Luke's father, Anakin, and we see again how a Jedi can be tempted to turn to the dark side, only this time we see what happens when he takes the easy path and embraces evil. We watched Anakin begin as a plucky child living in slavery, watched as he grew to become a renowned Jedi powerful and brave, watched as his pride and lust for power drove him to turn against those he loved most. These films were not true science fiction, they were written much more like soap operas exploring the relationships and adventures of a single family. It's a family soap opera. I mean, ultimately, I mean, space, we call it space opera, but it, people don't realize it's actually a soap opera. And it's all about family problems and that kind of, it's not about spaceships. The original trilogy is the story of Luke becoming a Jedi. The prequel trilogy is the story of Anakin becoming a Sith. The sequel trilogy is the story of Kylo Ren already being Kylo Ren. Yes, the sequels are mainly structured around the hero's journey that Rey is on, but at its most basic structural level, the sequel trilogy doesn't work because it breaks the mold of the family-centered stories that came before it. The writers tried to force Rey into the Skywalker lineage as a sloppy attempt at connecting this trilogy with its predecessors, but thematically it didn't work. It looked like Star Wars, sounded like Star Wars, and had the characters we remembered from Star Wars, but this trilogy just didn't feel the same as the others did. The further filmmakers take us into a long-running film series, the more effort needs to be taken to keep the work cohesive and the tone consistent, because every minute of screen time is building upon something that came before it. And Kylo will feel different to us, because everyone that came before led us to Ben. As audience members, we don't just see Kylo. We see Han, Leia, Luke, Chewie, the droids. We see a deeply layered history with years of cultural knowledge attached to these stories. Ben Solo is the culmination of every single one of these iconic heroes. We already knew what kind of man this boy would grow up to be. For the most part, a close-knit, loving, supporting family will raise a well-adjusted, loving, supportive kid. Kylo Ren grew up to be the exact opposite of what he was destined to be, and this film gives the audience no idea why. Writers Abrams and Kasdan took that explanation and shoved it deep into a mystery box, leaving the audience to forever speculate what happened to Ben Solo. For such accomplished writers, how could they make such a big mistake in utterly failing to flesh out arguably the single most important character in the entire sequel trilogy? Ironically, in trying to emulate the original film, the writers revealed a significant blind spot in their understanding of that story. They don't understand Darth Vader. There is an enormous difference between a pure villain that exists for no other reason than to be the evil antagonist, and more complex villains that can give alternative viewpoints, making the audience sit back in shock, considering the bad guys are also suffering and doing what they believe is the right thing. Now, I'd argue that most villains we see in Star Wars are of the moderately one-dimensional stereotype. Someone not meant for anything other than being a secondary bad guy our heroes can kill in their quest to stop the big bad. The movies give us absolutely no clue as to why Maul or Grievous are so evil, because they were only meant to be short-term, surface-level characters. They never needed their personality or internal motivations explored in order for the story to make sense. From a story-crafting perspective, we need almost no explanation for why Sidious is trying to turn Anakin to the dark side. Evil characters do evil things, that's just a given. 
This is the type of villain that Vader was originally written to be. He was a force of evil, meant to be killed off by our heroes and therefore needing very little character development. One thing when we're if we're comparing Kylo and Vader is that mm -hmm. I like to think about a lot is, you know, why do we ask the questions about Kylo that we don't about Vader? And it's because Vader in the first movie is not presented as a character in conflict. He's a bad guy. He's on team bad. He was on team good, but he was, quote unquote, seduced by the dark side. And that's the only backstory you really need for that character to work. And there's never any question of him not being on team bad. No, he's, Whereas, he's the he's the golem of the emperor. Yeah. Like, until the until that third film, like he he yeah. is a, he is a faceless, emotionless bad dude. One of the experiences that I had in watching these movies was in the first movie. You walk in there and you go, and so Kylo shows up, and you're like, oh, so this is the this is the new bad guy who's like cosplaying Vader, and then you have the then we then we have the conflict of oh, I'm 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 feeling the pull to the light, you know question in the back of your mind why is he on team bad if he wants to be on team good and then the whole time i'm thinking okay clearly this is the bad guy this is the bad guy that we're going to redeem and i'm thinking this like very early on in the first movie and then he kills han uh so i'm like okay maybe we aren't going to redeem this guy now that to me is the want and need that you had talked about david which is that uh he wants to he he wants to be on the dark side for some reason that we don't know um so he feels that this is the thing that he needs to do he needs to kill han solo to be solidly on the dark side and so then we get to the last jedi where uh quoting snoke he is like you know that that ripped you apart so this is the zuko thing of he gets what he wants but he's not happy with it. And he's, uh, and so I'm like, okay, maybe we are gonna redeem this guy. And then you only to get to the end of Last Jedi where he's like, no, not only am I still on Team Bad, I am the leader of Team Bad. And at the walking out of The Last Jedi, I'm like, okay, I'm very interested because there's no way we're redeeming this guy because he's the number one bad guy and you can't redeem the number one bad guy. Palpatine mm -hmm. cannot be redeemed. Vader can because he's underneath him but Palpatine cannot. And with nobody above Kylo, until somehow Palpatine returns, there's no way for him to do that either. The writers made a grave mistake when attempting to recreate a Vader-esque character for a modern audience because Vader and Kylo are two different archetypes of villain. Vader is an emotionless killing machine meant to be feared and revered. Kylo is a lost boy throwing tantrums, crying, and begging his daddy for help. We see such a wide range of emotions from Kylo in his first film, and we have next to no context to explain to the audience why he's feeling what he's feeling. Because the writers treated him like Vader, not realizing that Vader didn't need that character development that would be mandatory for Kylo. For Kylo, I do think about him on the movie level, but I think about him much more on the trilogy level as a whole. The reason I say that is that if you look at Vader in A New Hope, like that is a character that has to work in just that movie because they didn't know that they were going to do more than just that movie. Consider the prequels and the story of Anakin Skywalker's fall from the most famous and beloved galactic Jedi hero of all time. We needed so much exposition to cover his transition from chosen one to child murderer. We naturally understand evil people doing evil things. The audience needed no explanation as to how Palpatine could bring himself to so callously condemn Dooku to death. We intuitively understood why Sebulba sabotaged Anakin's pod racer. We never question why Jabba kept Han frozen in carbonite, why Krennic had no qualms about kidnapping a child to use as a hostage to force her dad to build a giant death laser that could kill billions of people in an instant. Evil is easy to recognize. And Anakin wasn't evil. He was obviously deeply troubled and needed tons of counseling and some good meds, but it was still very hard for audience members to see this troubled young man as someone evil. Humans as a species are generally very reluctant to accept change. We prefer to stereotype because identifying and cataloging help us understand the world around us. 
Anakin was presented to us as a precocious boy. Fiercely brave, talented, and pure, Lucas had to carefully craft the next two films to bend our perception until we could accept the change as feeling natural. I will come back and free you, Mom. I promise. If everyone knows that pizza is your favorite food, have you ever had to explain why you chose pizza as often as possible? If you're like me, they'll just roll their eyes and say, we already know what you're going to choose. But what about those rare nights when you want something different and everyone looks at you in shock, asking, are you okay? Is something wrong? Are you sick? Because they've mentally labeled you as a pizza eater and you're deviating from that food subconsciously messes up their mental image of you. Change is something very, very difficult for humans to understand. In fact, in his audiobook on effective communication skills, Dr. Kehoe teaches us that our brains are built to prevent us from changing because maintaining that internal homeostasis is a natural defense mechanism that keeps us safe. In order for us to feel mentally balanced, we need consistency. We need to know who we are. We need to know what is real, know who loves us and whom we can always depend upon. If your best friend suddenly decides to quit their job and move to a different country, you may go into literal medical shock for days because having your best friend by your side was a level of consistency that protected you. And we have few natural coping mechanisms that allow us to deal with drastic change. This brief view into our psychology and physiology helps us understand our reactions to these characters. This shows us why we can accept Anakin's turn to evil, but why Ben and Luke's stories feel so confusing. If a character substantially changes and the audience needs to understand that change as part of the overall story, we need to be there every step of the way so we can understand that change. Consider Zuko, crown prince of the Fire Nation, possibly the best redemption arc ever written. The writers gave us hours of carefully crafted character development over three seasons that transformed Zuko from pure villain to tragic reluctant villain to emotionally lost anti-hero and finally to an outright hero. Meanwhile, the Star Wars sequel trilogy tried to have that same redemption story take place by only inferring the necessary character development. As a quick experiment, I've gathered some frequently cited scenes of Kylo that supposedly show his gradual transformation back to the light. Let's examine each and see what the actual text of the story shows. I'm being torn apart. I want to be free of this pain. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. Will you help me? Yes, anything. Fans argue about the meaning of this scene, as he could either be asking for Han to save him and bring him home, or for Han to sacrifice himself so that Ben could stop living a tortured split life and fully embrace his dark side. It's left up to the audience to infer whether he's sad because he regrets what he did, or whether he's sad because he doesn't regret it at all. And you called me a monster. You are a monster. Yes, I am. What does this scene actually show us? At this point, Kylo could either be depressed, saying that he knows he's a monster and wishing he could be saved, or he could be saying that he knows he's a monster and he's accepted that fate. There is nothing in the acting nor in the dialogue that definitively shows the audience what is actually going on inside Kylo's head. Join me. Please. Why does Kylo make the decisions he makes here? Does he kill Snoke to protect Rey? Or because he's tired of being subservient? Or does he kill him out of a lust for power so that he could rule the First Order as Supreme Leader? And when he earnestly asks Rey to join him, what does he really want? Is he in love with her, or is he just feeling a platonic connection? 
Or is this another manipulation because he already knows that he can't beat her in one-on-one -on -one combat? They're filthy junk traders who sold you off for drinking money. The dead in a pauper's grave in the Jakku Desert. You don't just have power. You have his power. You're his granddaughter. You are a Palpatine. What was his reason for telling Rey this secret? Is this his good deed for the day? Or is he trying to cause her emotional distress, hoping she'll run away since he already knows he can't beat her in one-on-one -on -one combat? Or is he really in love with her and he's being open and honest trying to get her to trust him? Very rarely do we have any idea what's going on in Kylo's head, and his every action is utterly ambiguous in meaning. By comparison, no matter how much we may mock Lucas for his subpar dialogue, there is absolutely no mistaking his character's intentions. I'm a person and my name is Anakin. I will come back and free you, Mom. I promise. You're a Jedi too? Pleased to meet you. I care for you too. Oh my eye. It's your mother. How feel you? Cold, sir. Your thoughts dwell on your mother. I miss her. I don't want to be a problem. I don't understand. This is tense! Qui-Gon told me to stay in this cockpit, so that's what I'm going to do. What will happen to me now? I haven't seen her in ten years, Master. My goodness, you've grown. So have you. Grown more beautiful, I mean. Protection is a job for local security, not Jedi. It's overkill, Master. Investigation is implied in our mandate. I've thought about her every day since we've parted, and she's forgotten me completely. I don't like just waiting here for something to happen to her. I don't sleep well anymore. Because of your mother? Just being around her again is... intoxicating. <laughs> I thought I already did. You're the closest thing I have to a father. I am truly thankful to be his apprentice. In some ways, a lot of ways. I'm really ahead of him. I'm ready for the trials. That must be frustrating. It's worse. He's overly critical. He never listens. Suddenly, I'm afraid. This is my first assignment on my own. I am too. You're exactly the way I remember you in my dreams. I agree with her. I think the Republic needs you. I'm glad that you chose to serve. I don't like sand. No. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. I don't think the system works. We need a system where the politicians sit down and discuss the problem. From the moment I met you, all those years ago, not a day has gone by when I haven't thought of you. I'm in agony. I can't breathe. You are in my very soul, tormenting me. I will do anything that you ask. If you are suffering as much as I am, please tell me. You are asking me to be rational. That is something I know I cannot do. Believe me, I wish that I could just wish away my feelings, but I can't. Your presence is soothing. I'm sorry, I don't have a choice. Where are you going? To find my mother. I will even learn to stop people from dying. I killed them all. They're dead. And not just the men, but the women and the children, too. I wasn't strong enough to save you, Mom. I won't fail again. But you heard Master Window. He gave me strict orders to stay here. Not again. Obi-Wan's gonna kill me. Prepare! Put the ship down! You will be I can't leave her! I'm taking you now! No, I don't... My powers have doubled since the last time we met Count. I shouldn't have done that. It's not the Jedi way. The happiest moment of my life. You are so... beautiful. No. <laughs> No, it's because I'm so in love with you. I won't let this one become real. I won't let these visions come true, Master Yoda. How can you be on the Council and not be a Master? History of the Jedi, it's insulting. The Chancellor is not a bad man, Obi-Wan. He befriended me. He's watched out for me ever since I arrived here. You're asking me to do something against the Jedi Code. Against the Republic. Against a mentor and a friend. That's what's out of place here. Is it possible to learn this power? I feel lost. I'm not the Jedi I should be. I want more. 
and I know I shouldn't. I won't lose you, Padme. No, I promise you. More and more, I get the feeling that I'm being excluded from the Council. Are you going to kill me? I would certainly like to. I'm going to turn you over to the Jedi Council. I need him! Just help me save Padme's life. I will not betray the Republic. My loyalties lie with the Chancellor, and with the Senate, and with you. I won't lose you the way I lost my mother. I am becoming more powerful than any Jedi has ever dreamed of. And I'm doing it for you, to protect you. And together, you and I can rule the galaxy, make things the way we want them to be. Don't make me kill you. Then you're my enemy. You underestimate my power. <laughs> Just look at the dialogue Lucas chose for Anakin in almost every scene. He's in utterly open book, explicitly painting a picture for the audience, showing us exactly what he's feeling and what action he's going to take next. By comparison, Kylo is shrouded in ambiguity, his dialogue having multiple interpretations depending on each individual audience member's point of view. It's not until after Episode 9 comes out and his story is concluded that we're able to look back and mold those inferences to fit the character that Kylo became. Because he was redeemed, of course he was asking for help. Because they kissed, of course those earlier scenes show he was falling in love with her. Kylo's character arc only makes sense when you view it in reverse. And that's not how it's supposed to work. A proper character arc is supposed to lead the audience from point A to point B to point C to point D without being ambiguous. His arc, it fits perfectly with the one word that I would use to describe the sequel trilogy uh, as an individual movie and like uh, and scenes and as a whole, which is that it's contrived. The whole thing is contrived and it's like mm -hmm. they wanted to move in a very specific way and the characters are forced into these positions that they might not naturally be in or like, you know, a doesn't lead to B leads to C it's a leads to B leads to F and then yeah, he's redeemed. And, you know? Yeah. And it's sort of, it, it, there's an artifice to it. Um, the way that I think I described them when they were coming out is like, you could, you could see the seams of it in, in a very specific sort of way. And I feel like some of the, the Marvel stuff has a bit of that problem where you can feel them going, Okay, but next time these characters need to be here, so let's just let's just kind of sweep them into the positions they need to be in. Plot points can be mystery boxes, but a main character's arc should not. A character arc is an absolutely measurable, verifiable, observable transition utilizing a well-established writing process. Kylo Ren does not actually have a character arc. It is completely contrived. The story infers his character has changed, but if they had ended the story with Kylo dying here and Rey defeating Palpatine on her own, all of these other scenes would still have fit. Now he's outright admitting he's a monster. Now he's not in love with Rey, he was just manipulating her. All these scenes that meant one thing had he been redeemed suddenly means something completely different. Now, yes, sometimes it can be really, really cool to have a twist at the end that utterly recontextualizes every scene that came before, but for the most part, we expect character arcs to be linear, relatable, observable, understandable. Lucas built hours of character development for Luke and Anakin as he painstakingly showed how each got from point A to point B. We saw Anakin's journey because we needed to in order to understand. Lucas could have written the prequels to all take place a couple of years before Anakin turned to the dark side, but then we wouldn't have seen his childhood in slavery, wouldn't have seen his mother die, wouldn't have seen how much sense his transformation actually made. Once we take a step back, and see how little character development Kylo actually undergoes. I would argue that the sequel trilogy is not about Kylo Ren being redeemed. If we stop inferring and observe what the text definitively shows us, 
Kylo Ren's entire observable, verifiable character arc occurs in the last portion of the last film of the trilogy. He goes from trying to kill Rey to being willing to die for her, all because he had an imaginary conversation with his dead dad. Reverse roles, and now he's coming at her. And I guess kind of forgetting that he was there to recruit her. And he's like, <laughs> I'm like, uh, he just I'm gets like, really into the sword fight. Yeah, he just gets really into it. And like, now I'm going to kill you. And it's Leia, his mother, that intervenes and prevents him from killing her, which allows her to stab him. And it's, I mean, you talk about, oh, this moment of realization of somebody caring about me, your own mom sells you out to save Jesus this girl. Christ. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, as nonsensical as the idea is, one could argue that the only explanation supported by the text is that when Ray healed his wound, she also healed his evil heart. Which, we could have an entire theological discussion on that topic, but suffice it to say, allowing force healing to cure evil is not a premise that should be given much merit. So I... I'm curious if you've ever heard this, uh, David, that uh, did you notice when she heals him from the stab wound that it also heals the scar on his face? So no. the implication that some fans have gone with is that when she healed him, she healed everything. And at that point, she literally healed whatever was evil in his heart. And that takes away the decision, which is the important, God. most important part of a redemption arc. That sucks so bad. But that being said, if someone could force heal my depression away, let's do it. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, I would say that this, that that interpretation of her healing his soul with the, uh, or if, if you want to call it that, with uh, with that action fits perfectly with what they were doing with Kylo's character mm -hmm. in that nothing was his fault. That, you know, you have, uh, that, that there, that's the part of the arc or the two parts, two moments of the two pivotal moments of a fall of redemption arc that is missing from Kylo is that he does not have the decision to go to the dark side um, and he does not have the decision to go back to the light. It is uh, his snow, his heart was turned by Snoke, quote unquote. Um, and then you have the misunderstanding with Luke, which makes him like go crazy and kill everybody. Um, now, like you could say, like, you know, that the moment of decision is when he's uh, kills Harrison Ford. But that's too late for in, in my opinion like the, you for anakin that moment of decision is uh, he's faced with a breaking point decision in return of the sith or no it's revenge of the sith uh where he's you've infected me david but like uh, <laughs> where he's got he's got to choose between um you know saving uh saving palpatine and potentially losing uh padme he thinks mm -hmm. um so he makes a he makes a decision i'm going to be on team bad in order to save padme he does it for mm -hmm sympathetic reasons um you know or he does the, he does the wrong thing for the right reasons etc but and then he makes a decision to like save luke so there's a decision on both ends and kylo doesn't really have that on either end which is mm -hmm. part of the reason why i think like his arc doesn't quite work the original trilogy covers luke's rise the prequels cover anakin's fall and the sequels cover kylo's redemption that outline could have led to something beautiful, but too much about Kylo's mindset is locked up in JJ's beloved mystery box. Kylo has no raison d'etre except what the audience infers. I've heard some amazing suggestions from viewers that fully explain Kylo's personality and give his character deep complexity. The problem is that the films themselves treat Kylo as a mystery box not to be opened until the end of the trilogy. I think there's a potential in the Kylo Ren character in what we get. They could have written a character who doesn't know what his deal is and he's trying to work it out. But instead, what it comes across as is the writers not knowing what his deal is. And I think there's a really important, like, there's, a, there's an important distinction. One is how we perceive the character. The other is how the character is constructed on page. 
Darth Vader is a guy who we ask the question, why would he ever be on team good? Whereas Kylo Ren is a guy where we ask the question, why is he still on team bad? And so they're kind of like oppositional in their introduction of like where they fit into the moral universe of Star Wars. Um, yeah, just to just to clarify that a little bit, uh, the mm-hmm. v- for Vader that is not a question until maybe the third movie. Correct. But it is a it is a question for him, but probably not until the third movie. Not a question mm-hmm. at all in the first movie. Kylo is written as if he's a character embodiment of Schrodinger's cat. The text hints that he's in turmoil, torn between good and evil, but the story refuses to definitively state which way Kylo is leaning. Kylo acts torn when confronting his father, then after killing him appears to be completely at ease with his actions. Every time his father is brought up, Kylo appears neither bothered nor ashamed. Snoke's dialogue says that Kylo's spirit has been split, when in reality, Kylo appears perfectly centered and fairly rational in every scene since his father's murder. Kylo appears hesitant to kill his mother, indicating he's not fully evil, but after she's killed in front of him, all he feels is anger at being told to turn around and fly home. (laughs) Episode 8 ends with Kylo completely losing all composure and embracing his rage. Episode 9 begins with him appearing completely calm and in control of his emotions. Then he suddenly cares about his mom dying, even though he was recently contemplating murdering her. Kylo embraces the dark side in Episode 7, embraces it further in Episode 8, and is completely consumed by it in Episode 9, until the writers decide to redeem him, as the film artlessly tries to shoehorn in some semblance of a last-minute character arc. People take the moments of confusion that Kylo experiences and say those moments represent the beginnings of his redemption. Admitting he's a monster is not the same as trying to no longer be one. Deciding not to kill his mother is not the start of his path back to the light. In fact, look to Just Before Leia Dies and review all Kylo's screen time all the way back to the beginning of Episode 1 the only character growth that we can factually point to in the text is him deciding to overthrow Snoke and become Supreme Leader. Which, side note, isn't actually a change at all. He begins the trilogy by being in charge of troops in battle, and then ends the trilogy wearing the same clothes, using the same weapon, commanding the same troops in the same fight. There is arguably no discernible difference in his personality, leadership style, dark side abilities, or personal relationships between when he was just Kylo Ren and when he becomes Supreme Leader. Aside from blatantly physically abusing his underlings, these likely weren't things Apprentice Kylo would have done to were accompanied by a girl. But I'm also not sure if I could argue that these actions show character growth, as they feel too random to be intentionally placed as part of an intentional character arc. Instead, he kills his boss, and then who we is a baddie, so we don't feel particularly bad about it. Um, And then like takes over the empire. Like it's it's a it's a it's a uh, structural move, and I mean in the universe it's a structural change for him instead of a personal change for him and i think the film thinks it's a personal change um but it really isn't like he is the same dude as supreme emperor or supreme leader as he was as the underling he just doesn't have any boss anymore like he's still a whingy teenager or whatever this trilogy isn't really about growth or redemption kylo ren starts episode seven the same way he starts episode 8 the same way he starts episode 9. He is the bad guy in charge of the bad guy army and is calm and confident and powerful. Now, as I said before, I think that the writer's misinterpretation of Vader's character is a big contributor to Kylo being written so poorly. In the original films, Vader's redemption arc suffers from the exact same ambiguity problem as Kylo's. If we briefly take off our nostalgic rose-colored glasses, Vader's actions also have multiple meanings depending on the audience's interpretation. This boy is the offspring of Anakin 
Skywalker. How is that possible? He could destroy us. He's just a boy. If he could be turned, he would become a powerful ally. He will join us or die. Here, he could either be a full villain, totally prepared to murder his son, or he could be in shock, heartbroken, and willing to do anything to have Padme's child by his side. I am your father. Join me, and together we can rule the galaxy as father and son. Here, he could either be manipulating Luke, wanting to use him as a tool to gain more power, or he could be honestly pleading with his son to join him. It is too late for me, son. Here he could either be on the verge of true change, or he could be legitimately telling his son, I will always be evil no matter what. In fact, after reviewing every bit of dialogue the text gives us, I'm willing to go down fighting that Vader's redemption moment comes completely out of nowhere. I mean, just five minutes before his redemption scene. So, you have a twin sister. Obi Wan was wise to hide from me. Now, if you will not turn to the dark side, then perhaps she will. Vader heartlessly taunts his son by threatening to corrupt his own daughter. As much as I want to pretend that the original trilogy is a carefully crafted, complete masterpiece, Darth Vader himself was never meant to be redeemed. Look at any early versions of the scripts for Episode 5 and Episode 6, and you'll see that not only had Lucas not yet decided that Vader would be redeemed, he hadn't even decided that Vader and Anakin were the same person. So when I got down to the second film, I had to make a decision about whether I was really going to go through with this thing of him being his father, and uh, finally decided. That this is why, if you view the movies in chronological order, you'll likely be confused by Vader's lack of emotion. You'll see how much he loved Padme, and then see that same person not react whatsoever to the knowledge that his children have survived. In fact, we see no verifiable emotional response from Vader at all until almost the end of Episode 6. And that's because it was at that point that Lucas decided Vader would betray Palpatine and be redeemed. Likewise, Leia wasn't always Luke's sister. The other that Yoda referred to in Episode 5 was going to be a brand new character, Luke's sister, who was going to be introduced in Episode 6. Lucas, contrary to public perception, did not have a firm outline for these stories and how the characters would fit within them. In summation, I don't believe we can infer anything from this dialogue except that Vader spoke the truth. By examining the text, we see that Vader was a pure villain, and every bit of dialogue was a calculated temptation to motivate Luke towards a particular action. Vader's redemption moment is completely and utterly lacking a proper character arc, except one which the audience retroactively infers. And in trying to copy Vader, it appears the writers of the sequel trilogy made the exact same mistakes with Kylo. Both villains had no pretext, no clues, no observable, demonstrable change in their personas, no actual character arc leading up to their change of heart. Both these characters were written very, very badly. So the only reason people would say that Darth Vader's uh, redemption arc is so iconic is just because the character itself is so iconic. That's, I think, it. It is uh, Zuko's is uh, a far better uh, redemption arc just because it's so complete in its uh, entirety, like from beginning to end. It's the whole thing. Uh, I was just going to say something uh, that I really appreciated was uh, Rai throwing out the word atonement um, because at some point I have long plan to do a video that was entitled redemption isn't real because it always bugged the stew out of me that people talked about these redemption arcs and i'm like vader is still a mass murderer he was not redeemed like depending on what 
you know, maybe like biblical definition of redemption you want to go with. Um, but then when you start using the word atonement and I was like, that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking about now. Cause like, there's such a significant difference in saying that Vader changed and he decided I'm not going to be a bad guy anymore, but that does not mean he is redeemed. Like mm-hmm. re- redemption signifies atonement, I think in a whole lot of people's minds and it shouldn't, it, it, maybe we should have like a different word for for redemption arc because it's it's not like people think it means atonement arc but it doesn't it's like and i loved your description where you were saying that he has to have that act of atonement that comes after the redemption but i I think in the general viewer's eyes that those are really co-mingled well that the, like I said, there I think there were there's three key elements right there at the end where it's you have the you have the decision and the act and then you have the atonement and then you have the acknowledgement, uh, the acknowledgement by somebody on Team Good to go hey, you're not a bad guy anymore, um, even though you might still be a terrible terrible person, uh, and that uh, brings in one of the most interesting things that I've ever read about um, uh, redemption or uh, characters etc is that. Uh, you think about Anakin killing the younglings, right? Or all the time. I think about it all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great scene. Uh, the or um, or like my understanding of that is like I didn't, I wasn't paying too much attention at the time. I don't, uh, but I so my understanding of that was that a lot of people were really not fans of Anakin killing the younglings, and it, it is it is to me like a huge <laughs> a, a huge turn for that character in um like uh, if you look at his fall arc in in that movie he goes way over to the dark side way too quickly mm-hmm. um like it, i think it would have been a little bit better if like the the clones had done that and he was just there going like that's regrettable <laughs> But uh, instead of like, like, you know, Master Skywalker, what are we going to do? And then like he like lights the sword. Um, So it's the question of uh, and then you think about Kylo killing the massacre in the village in the very first scene that we meet him in is the when does a character become irredeemable? And the answer to that question, I thought uh, that I found that I thought was really interesting was that a character becomes irredeemable when the audience no longer wants them to be redeemed. Mm. Like there is, there is nothing like think about it. Kylo ruled the galaxy terribly for a year and did mm. awful, awful things, but he can still be redeemed. He doesn't get to live, but he still can be quote unquote redeemed uh, because we want him to be redeemed. Maybe he's not totally comfortable with being on team bad, but he no longer feels worthy of being on team good. And then uh, we have the throne room fight and everything, and then he is faced with a decision, the a breaking point. He has to, at this point, go one way or the other, and he decides to kill the Emperor, and that puts him on Team Good. That is re- his redemption act, but is not his act of atonement, which is the other, which is the thing that comes after the redemption decision. His act of atonement, because this is a fast arc, is that he has to die. Same with Kylo. It is the only way to accomplish a fast redemption arc because there is, he's done terrible things. He cannot be on team good without doing what Zuko does and atoning for all the stuff that he's done to everybody. And that's not possible. And especially, I mean, not only is it not possible, but it's definitely not possible within the confines of the last 10 minutes of the movie. <laughs> so he has to die. <laughs> that is his, uh, there's no thing, there's nothing, there's no greater sacrifice that he could make. So that is an acceptable act of atonement. He dies. But before he does that is one of the other really key elements of a redemption arc, which is the acknowledgement that you are no longer on team bad, which comes from Luke. Uh, what he to, you know, the take, help me take this mask off. Uh, and to, to put this in a different perspective, I want to cite a, 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 the exact same kind of arc um, in a different movie, which is Thor Ragnarok. Oh, y'all have seen that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, dude, yeah, I love I love that. It's pro- it might be my second favorite of all the Marvel movies. But uh, who's the guy from the boys in that? Kyle Kyle Urban, Urban. Yeah, Executioner yeah. Uh, is Ex- the character. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So his he has uh, a redemption arc very similar to Vader's and that it has to be fast. And it's also like 
he joins with uh, Queen, what's her name? Hera, I think. I don't remember her name. But, uh, and he's not comfortable with being on Team Bad. You can see this like very early on, which is, I think, what Darth is looking for in Invader's arc. Like, we don't really get that, that he, Darth Vader is uncomfortable until possibly the catwalk scene. But he's not comfortable with being on Team Bad in Thor Ragnarok. And then he is faced with a breaking point decision where, you know, they're on, he sneaks onto the ship and that's not him. That's not him leaving team bad, but you know, that's not his act of redemption right there, but he's faced with a breaking point decision. They're like the zombies are coming up the ship and he pulls out the M 16s and he fights them off that. And then you get Thor, giving him a little head nod. That's the acknowledgement. And then Hera kills him. That's the atonement. So it's the same sort of situation as that this is a very fast redemption arc. Abrams and co-writer Chris Terrio believed it wouldn't work for Ben Solo to go on living after the atrocities he committed as Kylo Ren. Like if you were like, man, we really beefed it with Kylo, he definitely can't be redeemed. Don't redeem him. And, and I think that's the challenge is like they kind of kept the constituent parts of Trevara's script um, and then changed things to be more marketable or... Uh, more, less risky is maybe a better word of saying. Maybe JJ was mentally stuck on recreating the Star Wars he grew up with, and like many of us, he had just never taken a step back to examine how much sense that original story actually made. Although for the life of me, I don't understand how the writers fleshed out Kylo's character without comparing his arc to other similar redemption stories. We see Bucky go from an honorable man to a brainwashed killing machine to someone so tormented by his past that he spends all his time running away and finally we see him develop into an actual hero trying his best to live with his past mistakes. Or consider Gru from Despicable Me. We see a slow, verifiable, observable character arc as the kids take him from a pure villain to whatever this is. While writing Kylo's character arc, Abrams could have examined the Grinch, a chaotic, evil, lonely being that slowly discovers joy and friendship. But does the Grinch's heart grow three sizes suddenly out of the blue, with the audience having to infer why he changed? No, the text shows us exactly why he changes. Ebenezer Scrooge needed three separate magical lessons in order for him to truly understand how bad of a person he was. By comparison, Kylo was trying his best to murder Rey, and minutes later he suddenly been solo again. The writers could have examined Vegeta or Piccolo, pure villains turned anti-hero turned reluctant actual heroes, a transition that took years over multiple main stories. Jamie Lannister, Theon Greyjoy, The Hound, Megamind, there are so many examples of character arcs that the writers could have drawn from as they crafted Kylo Ren's story. And what's one vital aspect every one of these characters has in common? Their character arcs aren't ambiguous. The audience doesn't have to infer their motivation, doesn't have to guess whether they're lying or not. The text makes it absolutely clear, but with Kylo we are left guessing. Kylo's mindset, personality, motivations, dreams, desires, these all must be inferred, and are enormous gaping holes in a story that's supposed to be a family-style soap opera centered around the characters. Look back to the other films and consider how often we see scenes being driven by emotional growth. Where are you going? To find my mother. I wasn't strong enough to save you, Mom. I won't fail again. I won't lose you the way I lost my mother. The sequels take characters from place to place as a means of advancing the plot. Lucas was taking characters from point A to point B in order to progress their character arc. Anakin didn't go hunt down the Sand People because Lucas needed an epic chase scene. Anakin had to go because his character arc demanded the utter grief of losing his mother. Why did this scene have to happen? The purpose wasn't they needed an epic lightsaber fight, although that was a nice byproduct. This scene needed to happen as an integral part of Anakin's character arc. 
He's overly cocky about his skills and he needed to be humiliated to further his anger and journey towards the dark side. This scene shows them falling in love and gives us insight into Anakin's opinion of politics. This scene shows us the betrayal he felt being asked to spy on his mentor. Lucas uses the natural progression of the plot to simultaneously deliver character progression that feels just as natural. By comparison, why did Kylo Ren follow Rey to the Death Star and fight her on the bridge? As we've already shown, very little in his character arc is actually changing. Nothing is mandating his presence. Kylo is only here because the plot demanded he be. The writers needed the Wayfinder destroyed, needed Rey to run away in exile, needed the ghost scene with Han to happen, and needed Ben Solo to be redeemed. Those are the reasons Kylo followed Rey to this planet. Plot-driven motivation, not character-driven motivation. This line of thinking now leads us to the most pivotal question in the entire sequel trilogy. What drove Ben to the dark side? What drove Ben Solo to the dark side? Everything starts here. If Ben doesn't turn, Luke doesn't leave. If Luke doesn't leave, the First Order doesn't rise, which the opening crawl explicitly states. If Snoke doesn't gain power, the New Jedi Order continues to grow, and Leia is never ousted from the New Republic, giving her more time to unify the New Galactic Senate. The entire spine of this story is built upon this single transgression, the foundation of the entire sequel trilogy and of every story that will follow after is Ben's fall to the dark side. And why did he turn? Examine the story we actually see on screen, and we can only guess at the meaning behind his actions. In trying to figure out Kylo's motivation for actions he took off screen, I am convinced that the writers never truly slowed down enough to properly write the spine for this character to decide what motivates him for good or bad. Maybe the problem really was the writers too closely copying Vader's introduction, not realizing that the two villains are nowhere near interchangeable. Maybe the problem was the corporate suits not giving them enough time to write, so they put off fleshing out anything they knew they couldn't fit into the movie proper. Whatever the reason, the result is clear. Kylo Ren's missing backstory is a poison. A toxic, necrotic, malignant cancer that sucks the life out of every piece of story that Kylo touches. This video and others I've made tend to be extremely critical of these writers' competence, so I do want to add the disclaimer that, from first-hand experience, I understand how difficult writing actually is. Our friend group made films as a hobby and we would spend hours arguing about whether this bit of dialogue or that costume or this bit of choreography made sense. Every draft of your script will have multiple revisions requiring dozens, even hundreds of hours of work. And then, on the day of filming, you'll discover a completely different way to shoot a scene and have to rewrite it on the spot. Point. Yeah, I was rewriting the script as I was shooting the movie, and it was during the shooting that I came up with this idea of having him not be in the end of the movie. Say he, in the beginning, was a little taken aback. Every scene has to be something within your actor's skill sets. Every scene has to make sense for the story, but also fit within the production budget. Every plot point and character decision has to make sense. 
Not just at this moment, not just within the context of this film, everything must also be in balance with any prequels or potential sequels. The writers had to know Aragorn's backstory and genetic lineage to know how old he was in order to properly write this scene. The writers had to know Aragorn's family history in order to craft his personality in the present, which set up his character arc wrapping up in the future. Writing a cohesive, entertaining two-hour movie script is an immense challenge, and writing something that lays the groundwork for the next chapter in one of the biggest franchises in history is a truly Herculean task. But it's far from an impossible one. Know where the story came from. Know the story you want to tell in the present and know where that story will go in the future. Your character arcs will flow much more naturally when you have an outline, a cohesive vision that unifies everything. For deeply complex characters, however, I would argue that knowing their past and potential future isn't where a good writer would stop. If you are writing the character of John Coffey, you don't just need to know a bit about his backstory and the fact that he'll die tragically at the end. You need to know him. How will he react when he's afraid, when he's angry, when he's sad? Who are his friends, his enemies? What are his unique skills? What are his dreams and ambitions? Which leads us to a rather unique analogy of approaching character writing for film, Dungeons and Dragons. In role-playing games, each participant has a character sheet, which might look something like this. It gives information about the character's skill sets, personality traits, ideals, relationships, and morals. Once you've spent some time really trying to figure out the who, the how, the why behind Kylo Ren, it becomes obvious he wouldn't be a good playable character because his sheet is incomplete. Here is a very basic checklist that I threw together as I imagined what types of things I would need to know about a character in order to fully understand them. Let's apply this checklist to Kylo and see how fleshed out his character really was. What can we definitively see regarding Kylo's personality without having to infer? He appears to be extremely honest and open with his feelings. He considers himself a monster and readily admits it. When he wants something, he outright asks for it. He immediately, immediately goes to tell Snoke that Rey was stronger than he was. Even knowing it would get him in trouble, he still told the truth without hesitation. When he was emotionally torn apart, trying to decide between good and evil, he didn't even try to hide his feelings. He openly cried and appeared unashamed of expressing those feelings. The writers did well here in showing us Kylo's personality, but leave us with the issue I stated earlier. We don't know why. Villains normally lie to the hero, and when they unexpectedly tell the truth, it's usually either a trick or that truth-telling is a unique character trait. So even though the writers did a good job with depicting Kylo's honesty, we don't really know what interior motivation is prompting that honesty. Likewise, we know that Kylo is incredibly driven and focused. First, he was Luke's top student, then he was Snoke's. No matter who his master was, Kylo was a hard worker and was consistently successful. But the same question arises. Why? What is driving him to perform at these levels so consistently? Does he simply want more power? If so, why? Or is he extremely insecure and he needs to succeed at his job in order to fulfill his own sense of self-worth? We also see that Kylo has severe anger issues, which continuously drive him to destroy valuable equipment costing the New Order repair time and resources for no other reason than Kylo cannot control his temper. But why? Is he angry at Luke or angry at himself? Is he mentally imbalanced and doesn't understand what he's doing 
Or does he truly enjoy letting himself fly off the handle? Was he really in love with Rey, or was he just lonely and needed a friend that understood the same power that he had? Or was this a magnetic attraction related to their dyad bond, and he really had no choice in the matter? Is Kylo actually evil? Did he really turn wicked because Luke considered killing him, or was he already immoral and used that action as a weak excuse for embracing his inner darkness? Does he truly enjoy killing people, so much so that he keeps a barrel of his victim's ashes by his bedside? I mean, you don't you don't see it on film, but but part of the backstory that they built, um, if you recall the scene where he actually takes off his helmet and Ray's tied up on that table thing and he puts the helmet into this bin, which is filled with like dust and the dust billows up when he smacks the helmet down. Right. So the original intent with that is that is literally the, the vat of ashes of everyone that he's ever killed and he's taken their bodies, burned them put that all those ashes into this big urn thing and he literally kept that scene was originally shot in his bedroom because he keeps the ashes of everyone he's killed next to his bed and then they took that and put the big ash thing in the room where he was interrogating ray because it worked better for the taking off the helmet scene so they had some stuff in there where you were like wow this dude is messed up but they didn't want to go that far whether disney wouldn't let them or whatever so I, that's like well funny. You know, just just to, to to chime in there, like um, the you know the the not letting him go that far. He's introduced murdering a village full of people. Fair. That is his introduction <laughs> scene. Fair. <laughs> the writers did a decent job of depicting certain aspects of Kylo's personality, but they obviously did not dig at all beneath the surface to answer the fundamental question of why he had those personality traits in the first place. It's like deciding that Captain America would be humble without putting in the legwork to develop Steve's character where he grew up as a sick weakling. For this first section on mindset and personality, we see that the writers tried. They knew the big picture points that they needed to hit so the character didn't appear completely flat, but they didn't know how to delve deeper to truly make Kylo three-dimensional so his actions resonate as believable to the audience. Now, defining a character's skill set is important in a unique way. This falls under the category of things the writers need to know but that might never be important to this story. In one of our podcasts, David talks about how, as a writer, in every scene you have to know what's in the character's pockets. You need to know what they walk into a room with, and that doesn't just apply to knowledge or skills or weapons. It could be little things, like a matchbook they found three scenes back that's still in their coat pocket. That matchbook may never actually be used for anything, but the writer needs to know it's there, because if the writer doesn't remember it's there, then the character can never remember. This same mindset applies to the development of a character's skill set. As a writer, you need to figure out what skills your character is born with, has already learned or will learn before the story is over. If you don't mindfully approach this section of the character structuring process, you end up with 2D characters like Rey, whose skill set constantly appears to develop out of nowhere. Did JJ know ahead of time that Rey was a great pilot? Or was she a great pilot because he wrote a scene that required her to know how to fly? Did JJ have planned ahead of time that Rey could speak Shri Wook? Or was the skill thrown in for the sake of a quick joke? Did Ryan consider how Desert Dwelling Ray would know how to swim, or was she able to swim because he built a scene that demanded she know how? Was Finn a secret genius that understood how both Starkiller Base and hyperspace tracking worked? Or did he have those skill sets because that's what the scenes demanded? Was Ray always a mechanical genius who could build a working spaceship from decades old garbage? Or did she not become so skilled a mechanic until this scene 
demanded that skill set? Or what about Finn's introduction? His skill set should have included everything that he needed in order to be prepared for the brutality of this battle. Yet the scene required that that skill set not actually come into play until later. No matter where you look in the sequel trilogy, you'll inevitably see characters suddenly acquiring skills they didn't previously have as the writers craft the story around basic plot points and mold the characters as needed. Even Han Solo isn't immune to the writer's sins, as he suddenly develops the Peter Tingle so he can shoot people he can't even see. So what about Kylo? Well, for the most part, I think they did a decent job with planning out his skill set. He's got basic Jedi powers, like moving objects, and has extended that ability to be able to stop objects from moving. Then he's got the standard Force mind-reading ability, although he's advanced that skill far beyond anything we've ever seen. Then we see he has the power of Force Sleep, making someone fall unconscious with the wave of his hand, which we could infer as being an extension of Force Persuasion. We see that he's a great pilot, just like his uncle and grandfather. So that tracks logically, even without having any precedent set forth in the text. And lastly, he's got a basic foundation of lightsaber training under his belt. I say basic because, yeah, he was injured, but still, he almost lost his entire right arm to Finn, and nearly lost half his brain to Rey. This guy trained with Luke Skywalker himself, and yet still was struck by two different people who had never even held a lightsaber before. But his fighting style was obviously intentionally shown to be unrefined, overly flashy and angry, with wild swings and no proper defense posture. Given the fights we've seen in the previous six films, there's an argument to be made that Kylo had very little actual lightsaber training from Luke, which would explain why it feels like these two are just swinging baseball bats at one another. In summation, most of Kylo's skill set tracks logically, but even so, there are some grievous errors, like the whole dyad mess where Snoke says he bridged their minds but later Palpatine seems to act like it's a surprise even though Snoke and Palpatine were the same person? Was the Force Dyad a part of their lives since birth? Or did Snoke literally create a Dyad where previously there was no connection? When this character was written, if Kylo had the ability to use Force Skype and Force Teleportation, then he needed to always have those skills in his back pocket while the writers give the audience clear breadcrumbs to follow as those skills slowly develop. Now, some people will argue that I'm nitpicking and that characters learn things off screen all the time. However, Luke learning how to move physical objects via the Force and learning that skill off screen between films is entirely different from Rey and Kylo learning how to transport physical objects across the galaxy. The heck with trying to harvest little Yodel's blood to try to duplicate his power, the First Order should be dropping everything, trying to figure out how to harness the power of whatever a dyad is. Imagine being able to talk to someone clearly, no matter where in the galaxy they were, not needing any technology, not having to worry about distance or signal jammers. Imagine being able to transport physical objects across the galaxy in an instant with zero expense and zero equipment. If they could develop Snoke's technique of bridging minds, they could connect Kylo with any Force-sensitive person in the Resistance, have Kylo steal their wallet and know exactly where they're hiding. Kylo could bridge his mind with Luke, drop off a thermal detonator and kill him from literally light years away. He could find every Force-sensitive member of the banking clan and steal their credits straight out of their hands. The ability to transmit physical matter instantaneously is a power unrivaled, and the implications to the Star Wars universe are easily as groundbreaking as the previously introduced lightspeed ramming. Each of these ideas muddies previously established canon, 
If Jedi can heal, why not heal Qui-Gon or Shmi? Why not lightspeed ram the two Death Stars? Why not give every single Jedi a shared Force Dyad connection? So the entire Order is one giant hive mind, able to communicate across the galaxy telepathically and transmit equipment, resources, weapons, clothing, or food to each other instantaneously. I am utterly convinced that when these characters were written, the concept of Force Dyad not once entered the conversation. And for an ability so profoundly world-altering, it needed much more development than I'm guessing it was given. I believe part of the issue with having properly developed skill sets is that the people in charge were convinced that each film needed amazing new force powers in order to keep the audience entertained. Hence episode 7 giving us force time freeze, advanced force mind reading, and force sleepy time, with episode 8 showing Kylo and Rey suddenly able to force Skype and Luke's new ability force projection, both of which are quickly followed by force levitation, force healing, force life drain, and force teleportation. This makes nine new force abilities that were introduced in the sequel trilogy. Now, this initially sounds like I'm saying the number of new abilities is the problem, and it is, but not for the immediately obvious reasons. The total number is a bit debatable, but I count 15 different force powers that were introduced in the original trilogy, with a handful more introduced in the prequels. Episode 4 gave us Force Choke, Force Vision, Force Persuasion, Force Random Sound Generator, and Force Voice Ghost. Episode 5 gave us Full Force Ghost, Force Pull, Force Jump, Force Visions, Corporal Manifestations, Force Throw, Tudaminus, 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 Force Telekinesis, and Force Comms Chat. Well, Episode 6 gave us Mind Reading and Force Lightning. Episode 1 gave us Force Speed and Prophecy. Episode 2 gave us more advanced Force Telekinesis stuff, followed by Force Reflect Lightning. And finally, Episode 3 gave us Force Yellow and Force Scream, or whatever this is. The, the point I'm trying to make is that by the time the sequels roll around, there are dozens of different Force powers, some with multiple variations. Like, this is probably based off telekinesis, and this is probably based off of force persuasion, where he's convincing her mind that she's so tired she immediately falls into a deep sleep. Now again, I'm not saying it's the number of new force abilities introduced in the sequels that is the problem, but each new ability needs to build on the ones that came before it. Not only do the writers need to know the history of previously established force powers, but they also need to figure out how their new powers will fit into the lore, and also fit with how the audience understands the Force to work. The old Force powers are nowhere near perfect, and the introduction of new abilities will probably always cause some issues. For instance, if Force users can move this fast, then why is this the only time in any film we ever see anyone do so? If they can use Force Persuasion so easily, why can't they just walk into any enemy base and use Persuasion on anyone who tries to stop them? If the Force warns them of danger, why does it sometimes not work? The unfortunate truth is that Force abilities have never been consistent. This has always been a subtle, rarely noticed problem in Star Wars. But it really became obvious with Kylo where the writers seem to have employed the use of a d20 to determine whether or not Kylo will remember he has a particular Force ability. For instance, Kylo is incredibly skilled at mind reading, able to pull very specific images out of people's heads, and yet he kills the man who had the map instead of reading his mind to find out where it was. Because this scene didn't call for mind reading, this scene called for Force Freeze. It wasn't until a later scene that the plot demanded that Kylo use his mind reading skills. And what about this fight with both Finn and Rey in the woods? Kylo is literally about to die, and yet utterly forgets that he has the ability to make her unable to move, or make her fall asleep with a wave of his hand. 
In fact, Kylo never again remembers that he has these skills. He is fighting for his life, outnumbered against well-trained warriors twice. Once without even having a weapon, since his blaster somehow vanished between killing this guard and meeting the Knights of Ren. Outnumbered, literally outgunned, and yet he never freezes anyone, never makes anyone fall asleep. Now, I have had some fans try to argue that I'm, what I'm describing isn't an oversight, but an intentional piece of the story. They say that Rey is now too strong for Kylo to use these abilities on her as he was once able to. And I would be perfectly fine with that explanation that actually fits well with the lore in the Bane books. However, we never see him try, fail, and realize she is now too strong, that she's learned how to protect herself against force attacks. This explanation that fans give is sound and well-reasoned, but also entirely extrapolated and not at all supported by the text. It is very difficult to admit that a story you love is so flawed, but the conclusion here is remarkably clear. The writers forgot what was in Kylo's pockets. They introduced a unique skill in Act 1, and by Act 3, they had forgotten it existed. Now, to be fair, it's not just the writers of the sequel trilogy that struggle with blending intriguing plot with believable character development. Writers are constantly trying to get themselves out of a corner they've written themselves into when they introduced something new or overly powerful. In the Harry Potter series, every single fight would have ended instantly had the bad guys just used Avada Kedavra. It's a spell that kills immediately and can't be blocked unless you've got main protagonist plot armor. This is why every single wizard battle is actually a battle. If the bad guys just all used the killing curse all the time, the good guys would be unable to ever be in the same room and would have zero chance of victory. At the end of The Matrix 1, we see that Neo can literally rewrite the code of existence to make the all-powerful agents explode. In The Matrix 2, because of some unnamed upgrades, he's suddenly no longer all-powerful. Because Neo couldn't maintain this level of power, or nothing in the Matrix would be a threat to him. Aragorn had an army that literally, literally couldn't ever be defeated. It would have been so, so easy for them to push on and wipe out Mordor before Aragorn released them from their curse. After all, he had promised them freedom if they fought for him not just won a single battle. It seems to be an almost unavoidable part of the writing process that when you introduce a new powerful skill, that that skill must quickly be handicapped or forgotten about in order for the playing field to be even enough to be interesting. So while it is understandable that the writers had to ignore Kylo's earlier display of force powers in order to make his later battles challenging, it's also a sign of poor planning to create an overpowered skill set that the writers don't understand how to properly utilize. Defining a character's skill set is an integral part of the writing process, important not just for developing the character's arc, but as a necessary component of each plot point. To know what your character is capable of doing in each scene, you need to know what your character is capable of doing. One of the defining traits that makes Kylo so interesting is the rich tapestry of relationships that are interwoven throughout his life. As a child, he was loved and nurtured by his parents, his uncle and Jedi Master, his fellow Padawan students, Chewie, Lando, and probably dozens of rebel heroes all loved him. As a young man, he formed entirely different, far more caustic relationships with Snoke, Hux, Phasma, Finn, and the Knights of Ren. In previous Star Wars stories, it is these relationships that are the driving motivation of the story. 
It's Padme's relationship with her subjects that drives much of the story of Episode 1. She's driven to her decisions, motivated by the suffering of her people. The Jedi only meet the Gungans because they have a relationship with Jar Jar. They only met Anakin because of his relationship to Watto. Valorum was only dethroned because of Padme's relationship with Palpatine. They only captured the Viceroy because Padme established a relationship with Boss Ness, who gave them an army. Anakin is only trained as a Jedi because Obi-Wan defies the Council in honor of his relationship with Qui-Gon. Anakin is assigned as Padme's guard both because of their previous relationship and because Palpatine wanted them to develop a romantic relationship. Anakin's angry because of his relationship with his master. He's driven further to the dark side because of his relationship with his mother, which inexplicably strengthens his relationship with Padme. Obi identified the Kaminoans because of his relationship with Dex. He found Kamino because of Yoda. Dooku tries to recruit Obi-Wan because of their shared relationship with Qui-Gon. Obi was <clears throat> rescued because of his relationship with Padme. Anakin's loss to Dooku is fueled by his anger over being unable to protect Padme. He later gets revenge and murders Dooku, bringing he and Palpatine's relationship closer even as his nightmares about his relationship with Padme strain their marriage. Anakin's relationship with the Jedi is jeopardized, pushing him closer to Palpatine. Obi's relationship with Padme helped him find Anakin, and it was their relationship that made Anakin angry enough to try to murder his wife. Because of their lifelong relationship, Obi couldn't bring himself to outright kill Anakin, which led to Darth Vader truly being born. The course of Leia's entire life was set in motion because of Bale's relationship with the Jedi, and the course of Luke's life was set because of the relationships Anakin had discovered back in Episode 2. In Episode 4, the droids were sent to the planet because of Bale's relationship with Obi-Wan. Luke meets Obi-Wan because of his relationship with the droids. Luke's farmer was killed because of their relationship to the droids. Leia was tortured because of her relationship with the Rebellion. Alderaan was targeted because of the planet's relationship to Leia. A big portion of Han's character was based around his relationship with money. Luke was saved from Vader because of his relationship with Han, and he could then only blow up the Death Star because of his relationship with Ben. In Episode 5, we only have this iconic scene because of Han's relationship with Luke, driving him to risk his own life. Luke's relationship with Ben leads him to meet Yoda. Luke's relationship with his friends drives him to face Vader. Han's relationship with Luke gets him frozen in carbonite, and his relationship with his friends is what later frees him. Luke's lifelong lack of a relationship with his father drives his grief in this scene, and in the next, his relationship with Leia is what saves his life. The first third of episode 6 is a relationship-driven story of rescuing a friend. Luke's relationship with Yoda drives him back to Dagobah, and his relationship with his father drives him directly into his enemy's clutches. This story is all about relationships. Because Lucas intentionally wrote Star Wars like a soap opera, the relationships drive the story. And in order for relationships to be used as building blocks, they have to be well-defined, obvious, and logical things that the audience will follow and understand. For the most part, I would say that Lucas succeeded in building a story that revolved around the people, around their wants and needs, and their personalities, although there were some obvious flaws. For instance, in the original films, Vader doesn't seem to show any interest in personal relationships outside of his master and his son. Even when his underlings screw up and he has to call in HR, he's not emotionally invested. Vader doesn't care. Nothing bothers him, and if we're being honest, that makes him a tad boring. By comparison, Kylo isn't nearly as one-dimensional and is far more interesting a character to study. But like One of the things that you said was a giant gaping hole of a question. What does Kylo think of Darth Vader? And 
or Darth Vader slash Anakin. And why does he not know the real truth? And why has Anakin never showed up to go, yo, maybe chill with the dark side stuff. Like that's uh, <laughs> my boy. Yeah. No, it's, right it's, away, it's, huh? that, that, that's an enormous gaping hole of a question. As I've said before, the relationships in Kylo's life are the bedrock of this character's amazing potential. And examining those relationships yields some interesting information about his mentality. For instance, what does it say about Ben Solo that as a young kid he was willing to leave his parents behind for the life of a Jedi? What does it say about him that he'd abandon that life of a Jedi for the life of a Sith, and feel like the only one he could really confide in is his granddad's old burnt-up CPAP machine? Then, after only a few years, feel his new master has nothing more to teach him, so he abandons the life of a student to rule as supreme leader, only a few years more before giving it all up to be a Jedi again. If you read through a list of the different types of personality disorders, it seems apparent that Ben Solo suffered from several, and keeping these disorders in mind gives us some possible insights into Kylo's odd reactions. We see that Finn's betrayal hurt and angered him, which is odd since the film itself gives us no concrete evidence of a personal relationship between these two. And as we discussed in the essay on Finn's backstory, these two could have had an amazing connection, as Finn was one of Kylo's force troopers in training who managed to escape. As Kylo observes Finn's journey from villain to hero, it would have made him furious, seeing that Finn had the strength to make the right decisions while Ben Solo was so weak he could only make poor ones. We can see that Kylo has conflicted feelings regarding his parents, and aside from Rey and Luke, his relationship to Han is arguably what the film paints as the most pivotal to his character. Apparently running with a consistent theme, Abrams decided to have Kylo's Achilles heel be his father. At face value, that's fine, after all, daddy issues were the motivation of one of the greatest villains ever written. The problem the audience faces with Han and Ben Solo is that we don't understand why. In the original films, Han was rough, yeah, he might be a smuggler and murder a gangster without remorse, but overall he was depicted as a decent guy. For a son to hate his father so vehemently would indicate the father did something incredibly wrong. However, The Force Awakens gives us no context as to why this relationship is the way it is. But the story doesn't stop there. Kylo, apparently, doesn't just have issues with Han specifically, but with father figures in general. Kylo has three different father figures in these films. First, he leaves Han for a new father figure, then tries to kill him then runs away from that father figure and gets a new one. Then his new father figure wants him to kill his first father figure, so he does. Then Kylo kills his new father figure, shortly before again attempting to kill his second father figure. And then we get the weird creepy zombie grandpa father figure. Whatever those implications are of the Palpatine relationship, which brings the total to four different father figures that we see Kylo rebel against. His obvious loathing for any paternal presence is very intriguing, however I would argue that in order for the payoff of these relationships to really work, we need some serious screen time devoted to developing audience understanding of these relationships. Instead, the audience only knows that Kylo is angry at his father, that he's angry at Luke, that he's angry at Snoke, and it's left up to us to fill in the gaps. My name was Ben Solo. When I was young, my parents saw something dark in me, so they sent me away to my uncle's Jedi Academy. There I learned the ways of the Force. Ben? Ray? Or conspired against me, and my family left me on this planet with this man I don't know? Oh, but trust him, he's your uncle. 
and it was all my mother's idea? They come and visit me occasionally, when they're afraid of me. All I know about my family is that I'm not good enough. I will always be in the shadow of the great Luke Skywalker. I come from a line of great Jedi, and I can't even come close. I'm not allowed. We understand that Kylo is very interested in Rey, which by the end of the story evolves into true love. This aggressive romance is tenuous at best, as Rey spends most of her conversations with Kylo either furious at him or looking miserable and crying. On Kylo's side of the relationship, I would categorize his contributions as being entirely selfish. He completely ignores most of Rey's questions, only dining to respond to the things he wants to talk about. Every discussion they have is caustically confrontational, and combined are an ironically fantastic representation of how abusers manipulate their victims into a relationship. We see that Kylo and Hux have a weird rivalry, sometimes working together amicably, sometimes gloating at the other's failure and eventually developing into open hostility. Hux likely thought that he was the trained military mind who should lead the First Order, while Kylo believed, through his gifts in the Force, that he was destined to lead. It's also interesting to note how their relationship is the inverse of the Tarkin Vader relationship, at least as we observe these relationships in the films. Vader was willingly subservient to Tarkin, which helped humanize the terrifying Sith Lord as we saw that he was willing to bow to a higher authority. We see the claim that the power to blow up a planet is insignificant next to the power of the Force, and then we immediately see Vader wield the Force, solidifying his claim about how powerful the Force is. All of that power and Vader is still totally obedient to Tarkin. The inference here is that Tarkin has extreme value as a military commander, and this one scene establishes not just their relationship, but their skill sets and personalities as well. Kylo, on the other hand, appears to be in command over Hux, even though both vie for the attention of their supreme leader. As opposed to Vader, Kylo is only willingly subservient to Snow, and he and Hux seem to openly despise one another. Because Kylo is not deferential to Hux, the audience infers that he does not value Hux's military mind or leadership skills. Kylo even openly threatens Hux, showing us that he is a total loose cannon with no immediate superior to whom he must answer. I want that map. For your sake, I suggest you get it. The Vader-Tarkin relationship elevated both characters in specifically crafted ways. Vader's mystical power demonstrated, then immediately tamed, establishing Tarkin's razor-sharp competence. The Kylo Hux relationship had the opposite effect. Their combative relationship diminishes our perception of the competence of the First Order's leadership and doesn't further our understanding of either character. Examining the relationships section of Kylo's character sheet shows us the writers did attempt some due diligence in this area although the work feels severely lacking. It doesn't feel like they went any further than declaring Hux and Kylo were rivals, that Kylo was angry at his dad, that Kylo resented Finn for leaving. It's as if they developed an entirely surface-level characterization and stopped themselves just short of discovering nuance. For instance, if we step outside of solely examining the first film in each trilogy, we'll note how interesting the Sidious relationships are compared to Snoke's. As depicted in the films, at least, Sidious tended to speak to his apprentices as if they were equals. 
You have been well trained, my young apprentice. They will be no match for you. Welcome home, Lord Tyrannus. You have done well. You have restored peace and justice to the galaxy. Search your feelings, Lord Vader. You will know it to be true. He could destroy us. Rise, my friend. You've done well, Lord Vader. Patience, my friend. Your work here is finished, my friend. By contrast, Snoke was constantly demeaning, outright emotionally and physically abusive towards his underlings. A scavenger resisted you. Try to take that ridiculous thing off. You were unbalanced, bested by a girl who had never held a lightsaber. You failed. <laughs> This type of characterization of the big bad fractures our understanding of who the bad guys really are. The audience is forced to pity Hux and Kylo as they're bullied and humiliated. Alas, you're no Vader. You're just a child in a mask. Abrams and Johnson gave us divided, openly insubordinate villains who are so antagonistic they'll kill their own co-workers without hesitation. Not to ignore that Vader did the same, immediately executing employees who underperformed, but overall, I find the difference fairly striking, as Lucas gave us fairly unified villains who worked together towards their common goal. Now, one bit of nuance that I believe the sequel trilogy writers accidentally stumbled upon was the unintentional comparison of Anakin and Kylo. When Abrams wrote The Force Awakens, he seemed to obviously be working off the originals, and quite possibly ignoring the prequels. So when he helped write Kylo Ren, he was trying to replicate Vader, not Anakin. Hilariously ironic when you realize Kylo acts like Anakin, not Vader. Vader is practically emotionless, a literal embodiment of him being more machine than man. And as I stated earlier, that lack of emotion does make a villain less interesting. When Vader finally confronts and kills his own master, he's utterly emotionless and doesn't say a thing. By contrast, when confronting Luke, Kylo is seething with barely containable rage. I believe the difference in the portrayal of these two villains is that we are seeing Kylo being emotionally portrayed as Anakin, even though JJ was intending to emulate Vader. The slew of rash decisions and emotion-driven based thinking makes Kylo a perfect recreation of teenage Anakin one who had yet to be tamed by being defeated by stronger opponents. Now, the writers did some good work with parts of Kylo Ren's character creation. There's just enough there for the audience to feel connected to him, to feel like he's a real person with whom they can relate. However, for the most part, I think I would describe the relationships in Kylo's life as being mostly superficial. The writers didn't delve deeply enough, and some wonderful opportunities were lost. However, in my mind, the bigger issue when discussing the topic of relationships is that the sequels don't truly fit within the same genre as the original films. If Lucas Six Star Wars films were soap operas in a sci-fi fantasy wrapper, the sequels were action sci-fi films in a nostalgia-fueled what executives think Star Wars is rapper. Laura Santeca introduces us to Kylo Ren and to Poe Dameron. Poe introduces us to Finn who leads us to Rey, who has BB-8 who accidentally leads them to Han, who leads them to Maz which leads them to find Leia and the Resistance, which leads them to rescue Rey, which leads them to Kylo, which leads them back to R2, which leads them to Luke. On the surface, the formula is there. The writers did seem to craft this story as Lucas did, where the relationships drive the story. 
Where the sequels failed was in the foundation of those relationships. Is Lor Santek a, a Jedi, a monk? How does he know where Luke is? Why does he want to give that info to the Resistance? Finn's entire personality is defined by the First Order, but how? Why is he having a panic attack in one battle and suddenly find the next, only to be terrified again a few scenes later? Why is he scared of the machine that he's a part of? Or the relationship Maz has to Luke, also a mystery box. What does Kylo Ren want? What kind of relationship does he have with Vader's ghost? What is R2's relationship with Rey so that he only woke up when she arrived? Are the Knights of Ren Kylo's students? His friends? His fellow ex-Padawans? Why do the regular stormtroopers seem to despise them? Why do the knights suddenly decide to betray Kylo and try to kill him? Why does Rey fall in love with Kylo now, when in the last film she was calling him a monster and he was nothing but manipulative and abusive towards her? The talk Anakin and Padme had here was immensely revealing, showing how broken he was and how, like women throughout history, Padme was drawn to that pain. This scene absolutely should never be cut from the story, as it serves such a vital purpose in his character arc. By comparison, consider this talk between Han and Leia. Based on what they are saying to each other, it would appear that this is the very first time that they've spoken to each other about losing their son. This should have been one of the most important scenes in the film, as two iconic characters try to repair a decade of pain and separation. But this scene leads nowhere, unless that talk was what convinced Han to confront Ben. In that case, this talk with Leia directly caused Han's death. The relationships in the previous films felt far more natural, developed with purpose, that purpose being character growth. Were I writing Kylo's character sheet, I would also want to be sure to include his romantic inclinations. Even before deciding whether or not he and Rey end up together, I'd want to figure out what his mental state is regarding relationships in general. And considering what we can infer from the givens we have, Kylo may not have had any good examples of healthy romantic relationships. It is entirely possible that his mom was working more than full time as she tried to re-establish the Senate for the New Republic likely meaning the Solos didn't have a truly ideal home life. Ben was likely asleep every night when Leia got home, so he rarely saw her himself, much less saw his parents interact as a couple so that he would know what a loving relationship looked like. Then as a young boy, he left his family to go train with celibate monks, who repress their feelings except when it comes to their sisters. Then, Ben runs away and joins the First Order, where we see no evidence that romantic relationships were allowed to exist. In short, we should expect that Ben Solo could have been entirely romantically stunted by the time Rey comes along, and if he were interested in her, he'd have absolutely no idea how to convey that fact nor would he have any idea what a loving relationship actually looked like. This very ironically it seems to be exactly what the sequels gave us. An improperly raised young man whose skill at courtship never passed childish elementary school era strategies of yelling, hitting, and insulting. That's maybe you could infer that, but it's never clearly established to me like what it is that he wants that that act by her would fulfill or would give him, you know, what what we said about before would give him what he needs uh, in order to be fulfilled and go, oh, I've been wrong this whole time. I need to be on team good. 
Um, so I think it, her, his relationship with her is like the most important thing for him. But because of that other big question mark and the question marks, the other question marks of their relationship, it just, to, to me, it just doesn't work. He seems like he could be stuck in like the early teenage years where you like just you you feel guilty about a whole lot of stuff and you feel like everyone's against you and all of this. And then seeing this this very obvious um, gesture of her forgiving him and saying, I care about you and all of this stuff could have really impacted him. This is all none of this is evidenced in the text. This is all just conjecture because the, the, you know, writers didn't do a good enough job in this section for us to know what anybody wants whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Like he, he, he's, he's literally trying to kill this woman and then she still cares about him. He has always tried to kill this woman and she cares about him. Like it makes so little sense unless you think that she is also suffering from some mental illness because of the way that she grew up as an orphan on this desert planet, always trying to survive. And she also does not understand what relationships are. And she doesn't understand what it's like to care about someone. And she's just sees this mentally abusive person. She's like, I wonder if this is love. Maybe he loves me. Um, he it's, definitely yeah, keeps I, coming after me. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like it, I, that's it. It's, it's, I don't understand. <laughs> No, you're, you're totally right. It's that moment of like, oh, I finally have what I want. I get to kill her, uh, which is not what he wanted, but like I, I get to kill her. And then that moment of, oh, I don't really know if I want this. Yeah, that's which, by it's, the way, uh, is it's Tom Catch and Jerry or the, yeah, whatever. Um, exactly. And that would be the redemption. That would be a turn for him because last time he was in that moment, he did the deed. He killed um, Harrison Ford. And then this time chooses not to. And so we would get to see that interior change. It's one of the easiest ways. If you want to fucking show. Oh my God. Are you arc. talking about a character arc? Yeah. <laughs> it's a really easy shortcut. If you're writing a where story. A where a character learns from the mistakes yeah. that they've made earlier in the story. The simplest way to do it is present them with the choice they made before and show them choose differently. <laughs> it's like the biggest hack in screenwriting. Like, and yeah, they, make it, like they make a decision. It's the wrong decision. They get punished for it. They learn from mm -hmm. it. Yeah, that's yeah. Relationships are the lifeblood of the Star Wars franchise. In the Lucas hexology, relationships between characters were, for the most part, fully fleshed out and helped drive the story from point A to point B. We see that very often. It was a tragedy that drove these relationships as families die, planets explode, and mentors disappear. When the writers tackled the sequels, it does appear that they attempted to stick to the same outline as Lucas, having the character relationships drive the story plot point by plot point. But once you dig into these relationships, all you find is the same ever-present mystery box, forcing the story forwards but remaining empty, devoid of context, subtext, and all deeper meaning. The goals and dreams of your main characters are inexorably tied to the overall success of the plot. Luke doesn't turn himself over to the Empire as a trick, attempting to put himself in a position to be able to kill the Emperor. He's putting himself in danger, risking his own life to try to save the father he's never known. Han dreams of wealth and freedom, Leia dreams of peace, Rey dreams of finding her parents, Finn's goal is to get as far away from the First Order as he can, Snoke wants to kill Luke and utterly destroy the Jedi Order. We don't know a lot about why these characters have these goals, but at least we roughly know what motivates them? But what about Kylo? The story of The Force Awakens gives us nothing to explain exactly what Kylo wants. As memorable as this speech is, Kylo could either be asking for help coming back to the light, or for help in fully embracing the dark. For this piece of his character sheet, again, it feels like the writers only did the bare minimum. 
They wrote that his goals were to find Luke Skywalker and wipe out the Resistance, but the audience has no insight beyond those surface level facts. Does he really want to be evil, or does he feel he has no choice? What really is driving him? Kylo Ren was written like a bad piece of fight choreography where the opponents aren't really trying to hit each other, where there's no story being told by the fight where it's all flash and no substance. We know definitively why Prince Zuko is the way he is, and we know definitively why and how his life was transformed. Every step of the way, we know what he wants. He goes from wanting to capture the Avatar, to wanting to be left alone, to wanting to fight alongside the good guys. This is how you build a character arc, utilizing the character's unique personality and skill sets, the relationships that character forms, and the goals and dreams that character desires to achieve. This brings us to the last point on my character sheet, hobbies. Now, I'm sure many people would consider this category the epitome of unnecessary overthinking, but the ironic bit is that overthinking is what allows writers to mold a character into a fully fleshed out 3D person. Peter Parker is a nerd, which is supported not only in the dialogue, but also in the toys he has scattered around his room. We know that he goes dumpster diving and loves retro tech, and this is all unnecessary to the story. We don't need to know that he loves Legos and sci-fi and building his own computers, but in the back of our minds, knowing these things makes him feel more real. Having hobbies makes him relatable. This is why Lucas wrote some of these seemingly unnecessary scenes for Luke. Playing with the T-16 shows us where he dreams of being one day. He talks about going out with his friends to Tashi Station. There was a deleted scene actually showing Luke excitedly talking with Biggs about the war. Or later, Luke talks about his hobby of flying around murdering innocent womp rats. JJ did some similar character building with Rey, as we see a bit of what poor orphans might consider hobbies. Growing plants, making dolls, playing make-believe. But for Kylo? We have nearly no information about who he is, what he's thinking, what he enjoys, or what he desires. Just as Vader before him, Kylo was written to be little more than a villain for the good guys to fight defeat, and leave as floating space debris, refuse that no longer serves a purpose. This concludes my amateur exercise at assembling the basic building blocks of a character, something writers refer to as a character sheet. Using this list to analyze Kylo gives us some fantastic insight as to exactly why certain scenes felt amazing while others fell completely flat. Which brings us to my favorite part in getting to do these analyses. If you've seen my other videos, my suggestions for rewriting Finn and Rey were far, I guess, easier to make as the story informed us they were brand new characters, so they only had to make sense in the present. They didn't have decades of familial backstory that had to tie into their present. No decades of plot development that still had to make sense. FN2187 was a stormtrooper turned hero. That's all he was, he just needed that story to be better developed. Rey was a bit more complex, while she was also a brand new character, her history was the biggest mystery box in the entire sequel trilogy. She could have been Luke's daughter, Ben's sister, another Jedi Padawan, or yes, even Palpatine's granddaughter. 
all she needed was for that backstory to be better developed so the sequels had a cohesive outline for her arc. Ben Solo, however, I would argue is an entirely different challenge. By happenstance, I found this meme today. It depicts the treasured games I no longer play. I don't really want to play old games from the line. I just want to feel how I felt when I played them in past times. <laughs> Sitting with my friends in the Jedi Temple, Master Luke providing ample example. No cheat codes or extending the rental. Our failures disassembled without being judgmental. His favorite games involved a princess. Kidnapped, held hostage, demanding egress. The other kids all clamored to play, to say that they were the ones who had saved the day. But it always came back to him to pick up the controller. Even older, the perfect soldier, the kids cheering his every win, every level boss fight again and again, they yelled his name. His name. Because it's not the game that's important, it's not the guns or the horses or stacking the corpses. I don't want to play those games again, I just want to remember what it felt like when... Ben, Ben, come play with us! Play with us! The fear and the anger and the hate, they saturate my state, my own mind, unable to navigate these feelings. I don't want to play those games again, I just want my life before Kylo Ren. Alas, even now I still hear the mask. Because this is life now, our heroes are broken and worthless. My father abandoned me, my mother created a circus, too blind to see the First Order rise, stealing their son, and this is canonized Luke Skywalker. Hero to all, now fallen so hard, even I am appalled. So I'm going to burn this galaxy down. There's nothing here left worth keeping around, and yet, I keep coming back to you. I don't even care to pick up a controller. It's not that I'm older, bolder, a soldier, or office holder. I don't really want to play old games, goes the line. I just want to feel how I felt when I played them. Yes, times. <laughs> Kylo Ren should have been one of the most interesting characters in the history of Star Wars. Ben Solo was so much more than Disney made him grandson of the beloved hero of the Clone Wars, Anakin Skywalker, the Jedi's chosen one, son to renowned war hero Han Solo, Ben's family name sparked awe everywhere he went. His mother Leia was the crown princess of the ancient House Organa of Alderaan making Ben the sole remaining heir of one of the most respected out of all the ancient houses that rule Alderaan. Along with his mother, Ben would have helped gather the remaining Alderaanians and worked to find them a new home planet, dubbed New Alderaan, where Queen-elect Leia Organa Solo would rebuild their lost civilization teaching Ben about the people he could very likely one day rule as king. Just like Thor, Ben could have been heir to an entire culture who were lost, needing a new home planet and hope for the future. Ben Solo was heir to the Jedi. Nephew of Jedi Grandmaster Luke Skywalker, the near-deified hero who saved the entire galaxy. Ben was to become Luke's most accomplished student. The two of them would work tirelessly to rebuild the renowned Jedi Order into a beacon of hope. One that worlds ravaged by the cruel empire desperately needed. 
Luke would have been the first Jedi Master in generations and one of few Jedi ever in a millennium who had his own flesh and blood as a Padawan. Uncle and nephew would have been inseparable, bound not only through familial love, but through the Force itself. Luke had seen firsthand the strength of love and the pure hate that lack of love brings. Luke and Ben would create a new doctrine for a new Jedi Order, one that embraced relationships and taught its Jedi how to properly embrace their emotions instead of suppressing them. The new Jedi Order would have grown quickly to an unprecedented level of influence as they helped foster love and peace throughout the galaxy. As Luke grew older, Ben would be the natural candidate for the next Jedi Grand Master, and would wield more power and influence than the Sith could ever dream of. Not only was Ben Solo destined to be one of the most powerful Jedi Knights who had ever lived, he very likely could have also been one of the most influential politicians of all time. Naturally wanting to follow his mother's lifelong political aspirations, Ben would have helped rebuild the Galactic Senate, where he would proudly serve as the primary junior aide to his mother Leia, who was unanimously elected to be the very first Jedi Supreme Chancellor. Ben would be charismatic, earnest, forthright, and by the time he was 16 would be nominated as the youngest vice chancellor on record. Working alongside his mother, utilizing her decades of experience, and with the force guiding their decisions, for the first time ever, the entire Galactic Senate would be guided by the will of the force. Ben and Leia Solo leading the galaxy into a golden age of peace and prosperity unlike anything in the entirety of recorded history. As years and decades passed, Ben would continue to split his time between the political arena and being a teacher at Luke's Jedi Academy. Eventually, Luke and Leia would both pass on into the Force, and Ben would take up the mantle of Jedi Grand Master, as well as being unanimously elected as the new Supreme Chancellor. He would be the strongest Jedi in history, wise and patient yet terrifyingly unstoppable in battle. Because of his genetics, the infamy of his family and a lifetime of very hard work, Ben Solo would have gained more influence than any other person in history. In every measurable way, he would have had more power than any Sith Lord had ever dreamed of attaining. This is the future that Ben Solo had in store for him, and this future was stripped away all because Disney wanted another tragic fallen hero. If you've tuned in to any of our collabs with Rybold, you'll remember one of his favorite questions used to dissect a scene is, why? When a character makes a decision, Rai asks, what is their why? David and I both love this question as it immediately delves into the very heart of nonsensical, surface level writing. When the audience can't understand why a character does something, Often, it's because the character is just being used as a pawn, so the writer can artificially create the story beats they've deemed need to happen. A fantastic example is Finn wanting to leave the First Order. He's panicking because the story demands it, not because it's something a soldier brainwashed from birth would actually do. In Empire Strikes Back, we're able to tell that Luke's why is because he deeply loves his friends and won't let them suffer if he can do something to help them. 
if the scene and character are written improperly, Kylo murders the one person that knows where the map is, and the audience has no idea why. Or remember how R2 was asleep until the end of The Force Awakens? Why? Not based on a plot necessity, but because they deemed that this timing would have the most impact on the audience. Or remember how they introduced Luke at the very end of the film? Why? Not because it was the best for the plot or for anyone's character arc. They had Luke missing for the entire movie because they couldn't figure out how to properly write the character. These examples succinctly demonstrate the problem at hand. The audience can't understand why things are happening, because very frequently there is no why. These aren't story-driven, character-based decisions, they are decisions made by writers who lack either the necessary skill or time to do the job properly. As I examined the tale of Kylo Ren, I kept this topic in mind. I tried to question whether each scene successfully showed us Kylo's why, or if his wants and needs, the very foundation of a character, were just another mystery box. And as I'm digging into this line of thinking, I'm discovering the question why goes much deeper than I realized, all the way to the core of humans as a species. At a certain age, all younglings will begin to ask why to every question, request, joke, any sentence that you utter will immediately elicit the response, but why? In fact, According to Harvard-based child psychologist Paul Harris, a child asks around 40,000 questions between the ages of 2 and 5. Now, there are a multitude of reasons why kids question with such rapid fervency. Some question out of a need for attention, others question as an act of defiance, but according to this study out of the University of Michigan, the main reason kids question stems from their desire for explanation. And it wasn't just the desire for any explanation, as the researchers noted that when the kids got brush-off answers, they just continued to repeat the same question and wouldn't stop until they got a why that made sense to them. Just getting an answer to the why isn't the point. The why has to make sense. Just getting an answer to the why isn't the point, the why has to make sense. In this New Yorker article entitled Why We Need Answers, author Maria Konnikova summarizes the topic, citing studies that show why why is so important. She cites the psychologist Ari Kruglansky who coined the term to describe this phenomenon, cognitive closure, and an individual's desire for a firm answer to a question and an aversion towards ambiguity. In fact, in 1994, Kruglansky, along with colleague Donna Webster, developed a 42-point test that was actually able to measure a person's need for closure. Article author Konnikova describes how this test was applied both to control groups and to groups of people who had witnessed terrorist attacks. In a series of five studies, the group who witnesses trauma had an elevated need for closure compared to the control group. They needed to know exactly what happened, who to, where was it, why did it happen. I'm sure many of you remember this happening in your own life watching some kind of violence unfold on TV and finding yourselves plastered to the screen, getting constant phone calls and texts from loved ones who are also trying to figure out what was going on. Yes, partially we're sucked in because of the drama, 
because breaking news is abnormal and abnormal is exciting. But once you figure out who shot who and why they did it, don't you pretty quickly lose interest? That was the point at which you achieved cognitive closure. We can observe the same reactions in Star Wars fans by comparing the public reaction to certain films. After watching The Force Awakens, audiences were overflowing with questions, and tens of thousands of hours of content were created across blogs, podcasts, and videos as fans unknowingly searched for cognitive closure. Comparatively, when The Last Jedi was released, we saw far fewer explanation-based videos as the film seemed fairly intent on resolving mysteries instead of introducing them. We see creator content shift towards trying to mentally coalesce what the film gave us instead of attempting to unravel mysteries. Maybe this is a biologically driven phenomenon. We've evolved a need to fully understand what's happening so as to evaluate possible threats. Or maybe it's purely psychological, driven by our need for internal balance. Whatever the cause, the research demonstrates that most humans need answers, and we detest ambiguity. Ironically, not only do humans desperately crave understanding, but we're so averse to ambiguity that we'll practically invent meaning, generating any slightly plausible explanation just so we have some explanation. Kruglancy described this effect as seizing and freezing. Because we're so anxious to get proper context, we'll seize upon the first plausible explanation we find. And because our brains want to protect our perception of reality, will freeze on this explanation that we've seized upon. Better data may present itself, more witnesses may come forward, but no, you still think the killer was the fiancé, because that was the first explanation that made sense to you. Now, like me, many of you probably balked at these explanations. It's extremely difficult to accept that we're not being driven to these reactions by intellectual curiosity, but by basic primal necessity. This basic human need explains why the news industry is worth so many billions of dollars, why families have gathered together every evening for decades to get their fix. We crave explanation, and we are severely addicted. In this guest blog from Scientific American, author Steve Ayen interviews psychologist Tanya Lombroso from the University of California at Berkeley. Lombroso describes how people not only desire understanding, but certain types of understanding. Apparently, most people gravitate towards teleological explanations, meaning they depict a function or a purpose. Hearing this term and its definition immediately made me think of fan reactions to certain Star Wars scenes. Lucas didn't write Vader as Luke's father. He simply wrote Vader as the bad guy. But we don't want to hear that. We want the teleological explanation. We want Vader to have a deeper function, not just exist because story structure demanded it. The interview continues, discussing how explanations are delivered. The comparison to our topic might be that not everyone who views these films is doing so from the perspective of college-educated, actively viewing, intellectually curious viewers. The writers have to craft their why to make sense to both the deep thinkers and the watching passively, purely for entertainment viewers. This blog also discusses another possible explanation for humans' innate craving to know why, which might be our inherent compulsion to worship something greater than ourselves. Pretty much every culture throughout history has worshipped one or more deities. Because intuitively we realize we can't control everything. Life is organized chaos, and it gives us a sense 
of peace to imagine that there is an all-powerful divinity making sure that everything happens for a reason. So we question in hopes of finding proof that life isn't anarchy, that there is a hidden reason, that things are happening on purpose. Next, I'd like to read a direct quote from this article in Psychology Today, written by Dr. Alex Lickerman. Quote, Why is what drives not only everything we do, but also our emotional reactions to everything that happens to us? Imagine how quickly your frustration at encountering that traffic jam on your way home from work would turn into horror if, as you passed the accident that caused it, you caught a glimpse of a mangled corpse laying beside a totaled car. Or how easily the irritation you'd feel at being told you have to work an extra shift at work each week for the next two months might turn into a willingness to contribute when you learn the reason is that one of your colleagues was just diagnosed with cancer and needs to spend that time getting chemotherapy. We're simply far more likely to accept a change if we understand the reason for it. Interestingly, our acceptance seems to hinge less on how much we like the reason and more on how much sense the reason makes to us. This quote succinctly provides support for a rather controversial statement I've made in other videos. Fans didn't really hate Jake Skywalker, we simply couldn't understand him. If the sequels had given us a cohesive, well-formulated, heartfelt story of Luke losing faith in the Jedi Order, we might not have preferred it, but we could have accepted it. We're simply far more likely to accept a change if we understand the reason for it. This is why Mark Hamill himself had to think, think of, of Luke as another character. Uh, maybe he's Jake Skywalker. He's not my Luke Skywalker. It, listen, I still haven't accepted it completely, but it's all This interview is absolutely fascinating, as without knowing, Mark was reacting exactly as these psychologists have explained. Mark didn't understand why so he had to invent his own reasoning in order to achieve cognitive closure. As we wrap up our brief plunge into the human psyche, I feel a bit of a disclaimer is in order, because we have to be cognizant of the fact that people are different, that these scientific studies represent a large portion of humanity but can't represent everyone. Over the course of recording our mini podcasts, we found that David is comfortable with far more subtext and inferences, whereas I usually prefer blunt force explanation that's difficult to misconstrue. I know, Doc, you, uh, you can be a little bit more literal when you talk about textual evidence. Um, me and Ryan can be a bit arty farty about it. Um, <laughs> but one of, the, one of the consequences of that is you go, yeah, but the story doesn't tell me that. And we go, yeah, but we felt it. Um, and so, you know, Vader does. And he and I are not alone in these inclinations, with many of Star Wars fans aligning with his preferences, and just as many probably aligning with mine. Because we each interpret data differently, you may think Kylo's actions here make complete sense, whereas I would need a Hamiltonian soliloquy to feel I understand his mindset. So if you honestly enjoyed these films and weren't bothered by how these characters were written, that's okay. From a biological perspective, you may be an outlier, like J.J. Abrams, who doesn't physically need cognitive closure the way most humans do. Like him, many of you may truly enjoy never having mystery boxes be opened. After all, it's really fun trying to unravel mysterious characters, figure out what makes them tick. And there are absolutely stories suited to embracing these types of roles. Nevertheless, Star Wars is not the type of story that needs to be supported by mystery. And Kylo Ren should not have been written like a puzzle that the audience is given only 136 minutes to solve. Our previous examination of human psychology gives us critical insight into where the character Kylo Ren succeeded and failed. 
in some scenes, he feels really present, really solid, like he makes sense right now in this moment. These are the scenes where the audience can easily understand his why. He kills the man who knew where the map was. This scene doesn't make sense. He tortures Poe because he needs the information Poe has. This scene makes sense. And this practice of assessing Kylo's why doesn't limit itself to a scene-by-scene -scene basis. I believe that Kylo does not make sense overall because the overarching whys that make up the spine of his entire character were never properly developed. This is the list of major plot points that occurred off-screen between episodes 6 and 7. This is where all of Ben Solo's major character development happens off-screen. And when major change happens off-screen, the writers then need to dedicate on-screen time to properly explain to the audience what, who, where, when, and especially why these changes happen. Why does Ben turn out the way he does? Why does he turn to the dark side when he was very likely going to be one of the greatest Jedi Masters and political leaders in history? One of the best explanations I've seen centers around the extreme pressures that Ben Solo would have faced. His grandmother was queen of an entire planet and helped save that planet from an invading army. She then became an influential senator and war hero, one of the fabled survivors of the Geonosis Massacre, and was one of the founding members of the Rebellion that would go on to save the galaxy. His mother was a princess, one of the youngest ever elected senators, a high-ranking leader in the Rebellion, and a war hero who helped destroy two galaxy-terrorizing Death Stars. His father was a notorious pilot before he became a beloved war hero. That also saved the galaxy multiple times. His uncle, another war hero, and the first Jedi in decades. Ben would have been under immense pressure as he was tasked with helping his uncle rebuild the entire Jedi Order from scratch. Thousands of years of Jedi culture needing to be rebuilt while at the same time helping the New Republic hunt down Imperial forces scattered to the Outer Rim. Ben would have been haunted by his heritage, feeling responsible for re-establishing House Organa and settling his mother's people on New Alderaan. And most of all, he'd have felt the immense pressure of his Skywalker lineage. Everywhere he went, people would talk about him, about how great he was supposed to be, about how one day he would be as strong a warrior as his uncle Luke. This was one of the most famous, accomplished families in Star Wars lore. And now everyone in the entire galaxy was watching young Ben Solo's every move and expecting greatness. There was so much expected of Ben, and he could have very, very easily have let all that pressure build up until it broke him. However, the biggest problem with this explanation is that you can't rush this type of trauma. The story would have us believe that in the span of five seconds, Ben turned from hero to villain because his uncle decided not to kill him. Ben's turn to the dark side doesn't make sense except on a structural level. Good guy becomes bad guy because a loved one betrayed him. From a story building structural perspective, that idea totally makes sense. But that's where the writers are supposed to do their due diligence in crafting the story arc into something the audience will instinctually, emotionally understand. Let's imagine that the sequel trilogy began when Ben was a child that we see him as a young boy, then a teenager, and finally in the last film as the tormented young man we know as Kylo Ren. This is one way that Ben's character could have been written, by giving us proper context for his turn. 
although I do feel compelled to point out how much I expect Lucas would have despised that idea, he's spoken about how he intentionally made each film look different, feel different, teach different lessons. And giving us three films showing Ben's fall to the dark side as he grows up would just be repeating the story that we already got with Anakin. I, every movie I worked very hard to make them different. I make them completely different with you know, different planets, with different spaceships, with different, you know, make it new. And there are other problems as well. For example, in the era of the sequels, Young Jedi would not only have Master Luke, but also the ghosts of Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Yoda to guide them and nurture them, making the story of a fallen Jedi quite difficult to properly pull off. Anyways, that side note aside, a second explanation that I frequently hear to explain Ben's downfall comes from novels The Force Awakens, Bloodline, and Aftermath, Empire's End, where it is very strongly implied that Snoke was influencing Ben towards the dark side before he was even born. One passage says, The baby turns inside her again, troubled by something she cannot feel and cannot yet understand. In another passage, Leia tells Han that she had sensed Snoke watching Ben from the very beginning, and she thought she would be able to shelter him from Snoke's influence. From the shadows, in the beginning, even before I realized what was happening, he was manipulating everything, pulling our son towards the dark side. While this explanation does make sense, I think it introduces far too many potential issues to be official canon. If Leia and Luke freaking Skywalker can't protect an unborn baby from Sith influence, then no Jedi can protect a baby from being corrupted while still in the womb. There is no reason for a Sith to spend years, even decades, trying to corrupt a Force user into turning evil. They could just go after every Force-sensitive pregnant woman across the galaxy turn the fetus evil, and then steal it after it's born. Entire armies of force-sensitive evil people created because no one can stop a force user from turning an unborn baby to the dark side. Star Wars has to stop doing that, because they did that with Anakin as well, where they, they were did. like, actually, the, the Emperor was tinkering with Shmi's womb from afar. That's because Star Wars, it rhymes. <laughs> you gotta say, I listen. I don't want to be. I know this is going to be contentious because you all are American and uh, hate women's rights. But I think it's possible in stories. We should probably just like lay off meddling with fetuses in general. I think it's probably <laughs> leave the babies avoiding. alone. <laughs> that is not what we do here. <laughs> it's probably worth avoiding um, as a story thing. We get a far less idiotic explanation in this interview with Adam Driver, as the actor explains that it's the absence of Ben's parents that causes his trauma and fall to the dark side. Quote, If you really imagine the stakes of him in his youth, having all these special powers, and having your parents kind of be absent during that process on their own agendas, being equally as selfish, he's lost in the world that he was raised in and feels that he was kind of abandoned by the people that he's closest with. He's angry because of that, I think, and he has a huge grudge on his shoulder. Concurrently, Abrams has gone on the record saying, It's more than just having a bad seed as a kid. Snoke had targeted this kid and knew that this kid was going to be incredibly powerful in the Force and wanted him as an ally. Now, to me, this explanation from Driver sounded like his own personal headcanon, used to try to understand the character and reach his own cognitive closure with explaining the why. The language he used didn't seem definitive. This wasn't Batman's parents dying, so he became a crime fighter. I read this as one possible explanation for Ben's turn that the actor latched onto in order to understand the character arc. And Abram's quote is interesting, as he seems to indicate that yes, Snoke was a bad influence, but so was Ben, already born a bad seed and predestined for evil. A final explanation into the why behind Kylo's fall leads us to one of the more audacious possibilities, schizophrenia. 
Earlier, we examined some personality disorders and how it seems apparent that Kylo was mentally struggling on many fronts. In this Reddit post, King William breaks down the evidence for full-blown schizophrenia. The violent temper tantrums, believing he hears the voice of his grandfather, the multiple mood swings we see over the course of the trilogy, even hallucinating the ghost of his father that he murdered. Dr. Travis Langley points out that we don't have enough data to really make a diagnosis of a mental disorder, although he theorizes that what we interpret as a mental disorder could actually be the results of a severe drug addiction. The dark side itself twisting Kylo's mind so that he loses his grip on reality. This version could have been extremely compelling. Maybe Kylo needs a sudden burst of power to defeat an enemy and save innocence from certain death. So in desperation, he taps into the dark side and allows his anger to fuel his power, allowing him to save the day. But now that he's tasted the darkness, he finds himself unable to forget about how that power felt. And like a drug addict, he lets himself slide further and further until he doesn't feel like himself if he's not steeped in the dark side's anger. I could see this variant of Kylo being written very similar to The Winter Soldier, where the brainwashing is substance abuse, slowly transforming Kylo into a depressed shell of his former self, desperately wanting to kick his addiction and be a hero again, but utterly helpless next to the overwhelming addictive power of the dark side. We've covered several explanations for Ben's turn that would have made logical, emotional, and canonical sense. But in my opinion, there is one crucial, absolutely mandatory thing that it had to happen for the audience to both understand his turn and care about him as a tragic fallen hero. We didn't just need a good explanation, we needed to see it just like Mark needed to see Luke Skywalker's downfall. Ryan did sit down and explain to Mark why, in his opinion, Luke had changed. Mark got his why, but he couldn't accept that why as reality. I believe that's because to reach cognitive closure, you can't just be dropped off there at the end of the race and get the closure you need. You need to see the first leg, second leg, third leg of the race unfold, or the finish line holds no significance. If they wanted to make Ben a fallen hero the audience would care about, we needed to not just know why, we needed the journey itself. Or better yet, were I making these films, I would have completely cut the redemption storyline altogether. The villain of the sequels did not need to be a Skywalker. In fact, it takes far more character development to properly show a hero's fall, rather than just showing the standard hero's journey. As a quick example, just look at how simple yet interesting the standard hero's journey would have been. Snoke is the bad guy, a new breed of bad guy evolved from the ancient Sith out far beyond the Outer Rim where he brings an alien army intent on conquering the Inner Rim. As Luke Skywalker's lead disciple, Ben leads the Jedi in fighting off this terrible threat. In the first film, Rise of Snoke, Ben would be a young teenager, still unsure of himself, but honorable and strong. In Episode 8, The Death of Hope, Ben would lose many fellow Padawans and face the challenge of succumbing to his anger just as his master Luke faced himself many years ago. In Episode 9, Ben would help Luke, Leia, Han, Rey, Finn, Poe, and Rose bring down Snoke, sending his army fleeing back into the edges of the Outer Rim. They would lose the original characters, but the new heroes would stand tall, ready to lead the galaxy with honor, just as their parents before them. This outline is so simple, mainly because none of the characters require significant change. Anakin's fall was hard to write. 
Cassian's arc needed development, Boba's story needed significant screen time for the audience to shift their view of this cold-blooded mercenary. I'd wager that most of you watching this video aren't writers, but imagine for a second, who was the more difficult character to write? Captain America or Bucky the Winter Soldier? Cap is linear. He's always moral, positive thinking. You know he'd never sacrifice someone innocent or kill someone in cold blood. Writing heroes is easy. Some might argue it's boring, but it's straightforward. The three-part storyline I described was uncomplicated. It didn't have drastic character arcs that would eat up valuable screen time. Instead, that time could be spent on subtle character development, making each role that much more vibrant, entertaining, and believable. Because the writers chose to focus on mystery, they are also forcing themselves to devote time for justification. Ray is a mystery box? Better devote time to developing her or you'll wind up with a terrible character that makes little sense. Luke, Kylo, Maz, Finn, Snoke, Palpatine. There are dozens of character and plot elements that are underdeveloped mysteries, and for every single one, the story suffers a little bit more. Adam Driver did a magnificent job of playing a villain. His performance is one of the highlights of these films that I will always be able to appreciate. But the fact is, making him a fallen hero demanded more screen time than was given. Ben Solo should have been a hero, the Luke Skywalker of our modern era, someone that young people can strive to be. Make him a hero instead and focus on the parts of the story that have always made Star Wars thrive. Focus on the world building, the unique characters. Focus on how the new Jedi Order is different and better than the one that fell. Focus on how Leia's influence on the New Republic would be the best thing to happen to democracy in generations. The best way to fix Ben Solo's entire redemption arc is not to needlessly mandate he have one. You guys have heard is uh, there's a bit of a conspiracy that he was originally supposed to live at the end of the movie. Um, if you go back and look at the shot where uh, like they they kiss, they separate and he he falls down and she's like holding him like that shot is almost positively reversed. So she's actually pulling him up from the ground right after or before during while she's healing him. Yeah, and he they does fall kind of weird. Yeah. So originally people think the specifically the Raylo fans were just looking for any excuse to think that he was still going to live. Um, but they think that he was meant to live. And then in the edit, they decided, oh, wait, no, he has to die. And so they reversed the shot of her pulling him up so that he is now falling down. And then they just did a still of him fading away into a ghost. I think the story would have been better served either keeping him evil entirely or never having him be evil in the first place. Now, the villain of the story, it's like he should be that character that you describe and um, or as does your vision of what he should have been. He should have been that character and she should have been the one to go, uh, not go, but I mean, fall because she has to me every reason to do so she's innately yeah. powerful she's has a terrible background she's not in control of her emotions uh she is perfectly set up to be a dark side she's, character she's anakin and, bro yes a, like, only times 10 or 100 yeah. but like, that would have been sick. it would have like, been amazing yeah. and that but like uh or to have in the middle like them switch roles where like she goes dark and he's like well maybe i you know i killed my dad and i'm not really cool with that so like maybe i don't want to be a bad guy <laughs> uh, but like uh or, yeah, yeah yeah but like she has every reason and every temptation uh to she has every reason every motivation to fall to the dark side it's just she doesn't because she is innately good and you know and good people don't and good characters don't do that and that term that i don't really like to apply to female characters comes to mind um and that's it's 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 a, it's a missed opportunities all around
so far, this entire video has been spent exploring the numerous ways in which the writers failed in properly crafting this essential character. But we'd be remiss not to explore the things they got right, because it's very safe to say that Kylo Ren is the most popular and most liked character in the entire sequel trilogy. Yes, you'll definitely see people cosplaying as Rey or Luke or Poe, but Kylo Ren was the pivotal piece that actually made the sequels somewhat interesting. Adam's performance, combined with a stylish character design, gave the lackluster story a bit of depth and brought new fans to the franchise. Which leads us to a fascinating paradox. If Kylo Ren was as badly written as we've discussed, then how in the world did he become so popular? Well, after several dozen seconds of extraordinarily deep thought, I came up with four core elements that I believe make Kylo Ren one of the most memorable Star Wars characters of all time. The casting director did an exceptional job in choosing Adam to play this role. Adam did an outstanding job in preparing for this role. From all reports, he took the job very seriously and gave it his all. No matter how much we may hate the story, it is very, very difficult to utterly hate this character. I'm not saying no other actor could have played this character or played him better. I'm not saying Adam played him absolutely perfectly in every scene, but I would consider both the casting and Adam's superb performance as significant contributing factors in Kylo's popularity. Even though Lucasfilm Disney later tried to backtrack and claim there wasn't any romantic connection between these two, this story was absolutely a love story. A dysfunctional, abusive, manipulative one, but a love story nevertheless. And like all love stories, the attractive male lead quickly drew the attention of a fairly zealous fanbase. He's on the handsome side of average, and in the right lighting, he's absolutely gorgeous, darling. Many viewers adore this character, and a Kylo Ren fan club was instantly born. And this is where it gets really interesting, because when you are crushing hard on someone, their actions take on a totally different meaning. I mean, drugging a girl, carrying her to your car, then tying her up back at your house while you <clears throat> probe her without permission? Where am I? You're my guest. You know I can take whatever I want. I'm not giving you anything. We'll see. What? <laughs> But the Raylo fans, it seems they loved these scenes. They see it as Rey swooning into Kylo's big strong arms and him carrying her away like a bride in a fairy tale. Hopefully we don't need to devote time in this video to dissect how problematic this interpretation is. But there is one aspect that I find especially curious. I suspect that the entire Raylo fanbase is driven by people enamored of this specific scene. Due to the lighting and the camera angle, this is without a doubt the single most flattering shot of Adam Driver in the entire trilogy. And it's his beauty in this single moment that utterly redefines Rey's kidnapping. Because he's attractive, certain audience members immediately develop a crush and want Rey to develop a crush as well in order to justify their feelings. But if we change his character's appearance, the entire context of this kidnapping changes as well. The Raylo fanbase absolutely helped drive the writers to make certain decisions, 
and all that happened because Kylo was handsome, which offset the sexual assault vibes a scene like this normally elicits. I believe these conflicting reactions help explain why I saw several fans upset that Kylo was handsome underneath his mask. Because beauty evokes a different reaction, and we want to innately dislike our villains, not feel tempted to ask them to prom. I thought the way that they should have written him was he's wearing the mask as a, I think, maybe would you call it an affectation in yeah, the would, first yeah. movie? Yeah, he's cosplaying Darth Vader. He doesn't need it. It's something that he's, it's part of his persona or whatever. Mm -hmm. but, but because that's what he wants. And then what they should have done to me is, you know, Ray beats him up in the woods, slashes him in the face. And now in the second movie, now he needs to wear the mask yes. because she, she hits them. And then when she heals him in the third movie, he doesn't need the mask anymore. Now know. he's on. Yeah. Now he's on. Now he's back and he can, he can be on team good. Or yeah. conversely, but, if killing his father actually fully drove him to the dark side, like he wanted it to, then he no longer needs the mask because the mask was the facade when he wasn't truly evil. Then he becomes truly evil by killing his father and he no longer needs the mask. Either way would have been better than what they did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which is not a lot of anything. Regardless of how a disfigured Kylo may have altered the story, we are still left with a love story. The quintessential bad boy, Kylo Ren oozed confidence and charisma while also being emotionally open and vulnerable, quickly expressing his feelings in a way that obviously shocks Rey. Men want to be like him, confident and powerful. Women are drawn to him, imagining their love can fix whatever was broken in him. Examining this film like it's a Hallmark movie helps explain why his redemption felt so forced. It made little sense for the character, but for his fan base, the redemption fit perfectly, proving the desirable bad boy can be tamed by the right woman. Giving the sequels a love subplot and casting an actor like Adam in the role gave these stories staying power, as certain fans will constantly be drawn back by the relationship, no matter how poor the actual story ends up being. I have frequently stated that the single biggest problem with the sequels is that they had too many vital plot points happen off screen. And ironically, this same flaw in storytelling is one of the main reasons that Kylo's character is so interesting. Because we don't know. Because Kylo is a mystery box, and mystery boxes can be fun to open. We see that Kylo is conflicted and is suffering, but we don't truly know what's going on inside his head. There have probably been thousands of pages of text written over the years as fans have theorized about what could have driven Ben Solo to the dark side. Because tragic fallen heroes are interesting, we are fascinated with understanding why a hero would choose to trade nobility for villainy. Kylo is so popular not just because of Adam Driver. Not just because of the love story, but also because humans have long found tragedies inexplicably intriguing. And unexplained tragedies? More intriguing still. Lastly, Kylo Ren is memorable because of his beautiful character design. Sure, maybe they straight up ripped off Darth Raven's look, but originality notwithstanding, Kylo Ren looked intimidating and sounded terrifying. The heavy distortion and face amplification are incredibly unique and produced a voice as memorable as Darth Vader's. Rounding out Kylo's appearance is his iconic cross-hilt lightsaber. In the entire history of the live-action films, we've only gotten one truly unique lightsaber in the form of Maul's double-bladed beauty. Maybe you could count Dooku's unique curved handle, or Yoda's adorable little toddler hilt, but for the most part, we have never had a unique lightsaber design done in live action, which instantly cements this character firmly in Star Wars history, regardless of the quality of the story in which he is involved. 
this character was destined to be popular. Because of Adam Driver's performance, because it was a love story combined with a mystery box tragedy, and because of the iconic character, vocal, and lightsaber design. We've explored a few possibilities for rewrites that could have vastly improved this underutilized character, but so far we've only examined the character's why. We've yet to really consider the writer's why. Why was Kylo written so badly, his character arc so nonsensical? Especially when you consider how stylish the character really was. The opening scene Blaster Bolt Freeze was one of the coolest bits of Star Wars ever put to film. The voice was chilling as lightsaber iconic. They had one of the best funded parent companies in existence. They had the very best computer graphics, audio engineers, and musicians involved. They had one of the most decorated producers of all time at the helm of one of the best loved franchises of all time. When they had something so promising, how did they drop the ball in fully developing all that potential? When you look back at everything we've covered, it seems to be rather a foregone conclusion that all the issues with this character stem from the same source. There was no plan. One of the earliest steps of writing, especially writing a sequel, is to fully flesh out your main characters, to firmly establish their backstory and know how that backstory will affect their future. You can't know where someone is going emotionally, mentally, spiritually, without knowing where they've come from. In fact, that is one of the earliest lines of dialogue in the film, Lor Santeca almost taunting the audience that he knows more about Kylo's backstory than we ever will. I know where you come from before you called yourself Kylo Ren. For an even more extreme example of how poorly this trilogy was planned, we need look no further than the reveal of Rey's backstory, which kept changing even while filming was already in progress in the last film of the trilogy. Ridley reported, At the beginning they were toying with an Obi-Wan connection. There were different versions, then it really went that she was no one, then it came to episode 9 and JJ pitched me the film Palpatine's granddaddy. And I was like, awesome. Ridley says, two weeks after hearing the news, Abrams backtracked. Maybe that wasn't the direction they'd go, so it kept changing. Even when we were filming, I wasn't sure what the answer would be. We'll likely never know if the problem might have originated with Iger, Kennedy, Abrams. What is clear is that the entire production team never bothered to devote the time, effort, and resources towards figuring out who these characters were. Instead, they only focus on what they need to do, as they mindlessly make whatever decision is required to push the story towards the next action scene. And interestingly enough, anyone who's analyzed these films can easily reach the same conclusions as have I. In this post, fans ask each other what might have been done to make this a better villain. See if any of this sounds familiar. Quote, If we had seen Kylo's fall in Seven, it would have worked a lot better. Seeing Luke's apprentice and Han and Leia's son be the next generation of Jedi, and seeing him fall and kill Han and destroy the temple would have made him more compelling. If we saw all that unfold, and Luke goes into exile at the end of Seven, then the rest of the trilogy, as is, would work better. The reason all these concepts were handled terribly is they all happened off screen. The sequel trilogy is weird because all the interesting character and plot developments are told to the audience as off screen events, while all the boring filler that pays lip service to the original trilogy happens on screen. If they knew Disney Plus was coming, it could have worked to make several series about it as preludes, but so many of the integral details are relegated to books.
like but Palpatine a lot of returns people. somehow. Yeah, he's ba- well. He I don't know how he comes back. He comes back in the opening crawl, doesn't he? Isn't yeah. that the? Um, well, he, came back, have, he, he came back in Fortnite. Technically, that's true. He t- he did come back in Fortnite. <laughs> I forgot that happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, reality's absurd now. We have now reached my biggest hurdle. The single point for which I'm most screaming for my own personal cognitive closure. I just can't fathom why this franchise is struggling. This is the same parent company that planned the Marvel Cinematic Universe, a carefully orchestrated, cohesive 39 film franchise that's still growing every year. And from what I've read, as quoted here by Joe Russo, they really had no all-encompassing plan for the MCU. They had different directors and writers who all worked together to build on what worked in the last movie, exactly as Lucasfilm attempted to do with the sequels. The biggest difference that I can see is that Marvel heavily drew on the existing material, so they had references for backstory, world building, and future character arcs. Conversely, Lucasfilm decided to completely scrap all existing canon outside of the films and TV series, forcing their writers to create all new backstories and world building from scratch, which they then weren't given enough time to actually create. Maybe everyone trusted Kennedy too much, never realizing her strength had always been supporting the storytellers and not trying to lead them. Or maybe Disney figured the Star Wars brand was so unstoppably strong that they could just put out just about anything and people would eat it up, which is not far from the truth. Or maybe there was a deep state type conspiracy where Disney wanted the franchise but didn't want the old stories and old characters to remain the focus. So they purposefully tanked the sequels and took a huge short-term financial hit in order to start over with a new storyline, new main characters, and a new fan base. Regardless of the reasoning behind the lack of planning, the script, or lack thereof, is the source of the problem. Ben Solo's backstory is so complex, I've easily written 37 pages on the topic. Yet the Abrams cast in first draft of the entire Force Awakens script took a mere six weeks. Granted, there apparently was a lot of last minute drama involving the first writer, Academy Award winner Michael Arndt, who had worked for the previous eight months on his version of the film without even finishing a rough draft. Disney released him from the project when he revealed that he needed 18 more months to properly finish. This last-minute scramble left J.J. Abrams and Lawrence Kasdan beginning to write their own version pretty much from scratch, six months until filming began to rekindle one of the biggest sci-fi franchises of all time and, quote, We didn't have anything. There were a thousand people waiting for answers on things, and you couldn't tell them anything except, yeah, that guy's in it. That was about it. Just think about the consequences of this rushed timeline. Six weeks to a first draft puts them at four and a half months until production begins. That's a minuscule 18 weeks for costume design, prop construction, creature construction, set construction, pre-viz CG modeling. You can't even begin the casting process until you know what the story is about. Although somehow, John Boyega says he went through seven months of auditions prior to being officially hired? The audition process was uh, seven months long. The first several auditions weren't even from the script, is that right? They were fake. They were were fake. They were decoys. So they were casting Finn's character for months before Abrams and Kazdin completely rewrote the story? Just looking at the production timeline shows us that the writers simply could not have spent any significant time solidifying these backstories and going through the steps of proper world building 
so that future writers would have a solid foundation to build upon. In the 2015 Force Awakens press conference, Kathleen Kennedy is quoted as saying, We haven't mapped out every single detail yet, but obviously everybody's talking to one another working together, and that collaboration, I think, is what is going to guarantee that everybody's got a say in how we move forward with this. And so far, it's going great. I mean, JJ and Ryan already talked at length because Ryan's about to start shooting episode 8. These guys are getting ready to head over in January, and then Colin will start working with Ryan and spending a lot of time on set with him. Translation, we'll just figure it out as we go. And for a character like Kylo Ren, whose core is centered around his backstory, deciding to only focus on how future content ties together was a death blow, as the audience is completely unable to truly understand him. But then again, we were never supposed to. In an early interview, J.J. Abrams said that the key for the film was to return to the roots of the first Star Wars film and be based more on emotion than explanation. These filmmakers approached this trilogy like it was the beginning of a story, instead of the ending. The sequel trilogy was a continuation of multiple overlapping plot points and character arcs. To understand Kylo Ren, you have to understand Leia, Han, and the Rebellion, and to understand them, you have to understand Padme, Anakin, the Republic, and the Clone Wars. Every single one of these characters had potential, and could easily have had their own spin-off movie or TV series. But because these films were so poorly planned, that future was lost and subsequent novels would now be required reading as Lucasfilm Disney desperately attempts to retroactively correct everything they didn't take the time to plan out from the beginning. The acting, the costume design, the love story, the burden of family legacy, whether you love or hate the sequels, Kylo Ren will go down in history as one of the most iconic in the entire Star Wars saga. This character had so much working in his favor. Grandson of a slave, heir to the Jedi, Prince of House Organa of Alderaan, last of his people, son of legendary heroes. Adam Driver threw himself into the role and delivered a memorable performance. But while Kylo Ren may have been the best part of the sequel trilogy, he was also the most disappointing. Star Wars fans lost something truly amazing, with the unrealized potential of Kylo's backstory so staggering that he is easily one of the most wasted characters in the entirety of film history. Thanks for watching everyone. And I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Darth. I was like, well, I disagree that he doesn't have an arc. I think it comes right at the very end. And it's a very quick, short, fast arc. But it is there, in my opinion. And I'm now really waiting for David to tell me why I'm wrong about that. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't going to listen. That's not. Listen, I I, I, I I try not to specialize in dunking on nerds anymore. Um, I like to think that I've grown and matured a little bit since 2012.